as tank, artillery and air battles rage across eastern Ukraine, on a scale not seen since the Second World War, Europe and America have reacted with alarm, scrambling to provide money, advice, weapons and ammunition to support the Ukrainian army. Russia has thrown thousands of tanks and armored combat vehicles into the war. High on the wish list of Ukrainian President Zelensky's generals was always the M1A2 Abrams main battle tank. On 25th of January 2023, US President Joe Biden announced that 31 Abrams tanks would be sent to Ukraine. But how will a tank that was designed in the 1970s and first fielded in the mid-1980s fare against significantly upgraded Russian tanks in the third decade of the 21st century? Is Vladimir Putin right to be terrified of the M1 Abrams? Let's crunch some of the numbers and get a sense of where the Abrams comes from, what it can do, how it might make an impact on the battlefields of Ukraine, and why Vladimir Putin should be afraid. To understand the birth of the Abrams and its current variant, the M1A2, we need to go right back to the Cold War, between 1945 and 1990, where NATO and the Soviet Union were squaring up against each other in Central Europe. Throughout these decades, the most likely conflict between the two sides seemed to be a massive ground war fought in West Germany. In the 1970s, the main American battle tank, the M60, was becoming obsolete. A replacement was needed, one that was designed for high mobility in modern armored ground warfare and that could defeat the latest generation of Soviet armor. Some early US-German collaboration looked at producing a tank together. The Germans were also looking to replace the Leopard 1, but this MBT-70 program was expensive and the tank design problematic. American designers started again. In 1973, at the heart of the requirements for a new tank were that it could survive a strike by a Soviet tank gun at 800 meters and mount a 105 mm main armament. Proposals came in from Chrysler and General Motors. There were several issues to be considered. The Chrysler proposal had a gas turbine engine, while the General Motors design offered a diesel. This had implications for cost and reliability. In the mid-1970s, there was considerable interest in a new British defensive composite armor innovation called Cobham Armor, which through a clever and highly classified technique of layering ceramic tiles and open spaces in such a way as to channel, deflect, and dissipate the intense heat and impact of an anti-tank round. Although early models of the new tank design that would become the Abram M1 mounted a 105mm gun, it was soon clear that a 120mm would be much more potent. The armored warfare doctrine of the time emphasized being able to strike the enemy at long range before he could get in a first shot. It seems that for most of the evaluation process, the General Motors demonstration model was favored. However, at the last minute, the decision was overturned by then Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld, who wanted to hear all the arguments again. He finally decided in favor of the Chrysler version. There may have been a bit of DC politics involved. The M1 tank acquired an official name Abrams, after General Creighton Abrams, a former tank commander in Patton's Third Army in the Second World War, and who had worked hard in the 1960s and 70s to push forward US main battle tank design. The original M1 Abrams tank came into service in 1980. Over 3,000 were produced between 1979 and 1985, many with a 105mm gun. But a few years later, the M1 was being replaced by an upgraded version, the M1A1. These all had a 120mm main gun. Nearly 5,000 M1A1s were produced between 1986 and 1992, 4,000 for the American Army and 400 for the US Marines. Each tank cost over $4 million. The Abrams has a crew of four and weighs 57 tons, although different models can weigh as much as 78 tons. It can reach speeds of 67 kilometers an hour and has a range of 465 kilometers. The M829A2 armor-piercing shell can deal with newer Russian tanks, the T80 and T90, which have Contact 5 Explosive Reactive Armor, ERA. In addition to the 120mm main armament, the Abrams mounts a coaxial machine gun and a 50 caliber heavy machine gun on top of the turret. The Abrams is heavier than most current main battle tanks and it's bulky, but it's also quite agile. One nickname it has acquired is Whispering Death because the gas turbine engine is relatively quiet. The Abrams also had a lot of safety features designed specifically to protect the crew. Crew survivability has always been an important part of the Abrams design concept. The crew is always the most precious asset of any tank, so the tank ammunition is stored in the back compartment of the tank turret 
and carefully sealed away from the crew. This has turned out to be a vital design innovation. Social media is now full of clips of Russian tanks in Ukraine catastrophically exploding, their turrets flung up into the air because the ammunition is stored, unprotected, in the crew compartment. The M1A1 has improved defenses. Now the composite armor also includes screens of heavy depleted uranium and twin sets of smoke dischargers. Some models have anti-missile jamming measures. The rear of the turret has blowout panels to redirect blast in the event of ammunition explosions. The crew interior has Kevlar lining around the turret to protect against spalling, which is caused when high-velocity rounds strike the outside of the tank and cause fragments of metal to flake off at high speed and bounce around inside the tank. This thing is combat-proven. Here's what we mean. The M1 Abrams crews spent years of training during the 1980s in the wooded, mountainous and population-heavy arena of Germany as they prepared to conduct defensive operations against a Soviet assault. It was highly ironic, therefore, that the Abrams' first actual combat deployment was in an offensive role in the unpopulated deserts of the Middle East. Nearly 2,000 Abrams were sent to the Gulf to help force Saddam Hussein's army out of Kuwait. The Abrams performed excellently and was superior to the Iraqi T-55s, T-62s, and even the relatively modern T-72s that equipped Saddam's army. The Abrams were highly mobile, easy to operate, and had highly advanced command, communications, and fire control systems that enabled small numbers of Abrams to speedily maneuver, engage, and defeat many times more Soviet model tanks at greater ranges. Hits against Iraqi armor were achieved as far as four kilometers away. Soviet tanks struggled to achieve half that distance. The Battle of Easting 73 was but one example of the flexible firepower that the Abrams could bring to bear. During the whole Gulf War, although some were hit by friendly fire and some had to be destroyed to prevent them falling into enemy hands, few Abrams were hit by enemy action, and none were destroyed. Of a force of nearly 2,000, only 23 were damaged or destroyed. The Abrams was clearly more than a match for Soviet-era armor. Okay, now let's talk about improvements, combat lessons, and also challenges. Modifications to the Abrams were made as a result of lessons learned during the Gulf War. Improvements were made to the fire control system and weapon sites, but the innovations kicked up several notches when the new M1A2 version of the Abrams was revealed. Development work had begun in 1988, and the first models were produced in 1992. This was a significant evolution of the Abrams platform. The tank commander now had an independent thermal viewer and a weapon station and navigation equipment. The fire control system was again upgraded. Many of the improvements involved adding more computer and data management capacity. This also meant that the internal cooling system needed to be upgraded because of the extra heat generated by the new IT systems. More combat lessons were learnt the hard way during the 2003 Second Gulf War, also known as the Iraq War and the insurgency aftermath. Further modifications to the Abrams were made. For instance, combat identification panels were important to help reduce the risk of friendly fire incidents. There were some tank-on-tank -tank engagements before the Saddam regime collapsed. In one incident, Abrams tanks destroyed seven T-72s in a matter of minutes at very close range. The Iraqi tank crews were poorly trained and unable to react with sufficient speed. Having strong situational awareness and good communications is every bit as important as having thick armor and a big gun. Since the creation of the tank in 1916, all tank crews have struggled to achieve all-round ease of visibility. It's simply very difficult to see what you're doing, whether driving, firing a gun, or commanding a tank in battle, when peering out of a narrow vision slit. This has always made tanks vulnerable at night or in enclosed areas, such as forests and urban areas. Ideally, the commander sits with his head out of the turret so he can clearly see in every direction from a high position, but he is then, of course, at high risk of getting targeted by a sniper. Urban fighting in Iraq against terrorists and local militia forces caused major problems for the Abrams and the crews. The Abrams was highly vulnerable to close-up infantry creeping up on the side and rear of the vehicle, hiding in alleys and buildings. They were armed with rocket-propelled grenades, anti-tank guided missiles, mines, IEDs, and even a heavy machine gun or a simple petrol bomb. At short range, many of these weapons could be sufficient to knock a tank out or damage it sufficiently in order to cause it to retire or be abandoned. You certainly do not have to destroy a tank in order to render it ineffective. Missiles were fired at tracks and wheels. Rocket-propelled grenades struck the less well-protected top and rear of the tank. Some parts of a tank are very vulnerable. 
Pieces of communications equipment and vision slits can be damaged and reduce the effectiveness of the tank. Even a brick can damage a radio aerial. Some Abrams had to be hastily abandoned when extra fuel stored on the outside of the tank burst into flames. This time, the conflict was primarily in an urban environment and there was little opportunity for the Abrams to play to its strengths, engaging enemy vehicles at long range. The Abrams was a child of the Cold War, intended to face heavily armed threats to its front. Total losses inflicted on Abrams tanks during this second Gulf War were much more sobering to contemplate. By 2005, 80 tanks had been put out of action, of which 63 had to be returned to America for major repairs and 17 were so damaged that they had to be written off as beyond repair. Nearly two years later, more than 500 Abrams had been returned to the US for repair work as a result of the combat in Iraq. In 2008, a particular Russian anti-tank rocket-propelled grenade, the RPG-29, was considered a very serious threat to the Abrams. Its innovative missile design gave it a double charge, which allowed it to first penetrate the reactive armor and then also the composite armor underneath it. In accordance with the lessons learned in Iraq, a new modification kit was introduced, specifically designed to deal with the particular vulnerabilities that the Abrams was experiencing in the grueling city fighting. It was called TUSK, the Tank Urban Survival Kit. There was also a TUSK II kit. The TUSK program offered a series of modules and components that could be fitted to the tank or removed according to the tactical situation the crew was facing. The kits provided improved protection, extra firepower and better situational awareness. Some of the features included add-on reactive armor, extra smoke and anti-personnel grenade discharges, transparent protection around the commander's heavy machine gun position, a thermal sight for the machine gun, 360-degree and rear-fitted cameras, and a telephone at the back of the tank to allow direct communication with the accompanying infantry. Slat armor could be added. These are forms of cages or metal grills around particularly vulnerable parts of the tank, such as the rear and crew areas. The Russians have been experimenting with these in Ukraine. But in poorly trained hands, the Abrams could be just as vulnerable as any other tank. From 2010, the Americans equipped the new Iraqi army with a vast array of combat equipment. 140 M1A1 Abrams were given to the Iraqi Defense Forces. In 2014, they were used against ISIS. However, within three months, over 40 of the tanks had been destroyed, damaged, or captured. At the end of 2014, the Iraqi army had only 40 Abrams tanks still operational. It's a useful reminder that the skills, training, morale, and capabilities of the crew remain at the heart of the effectiveness of the Abrams. Other packages of upgrades, separate enhancement packages, SEP, versions 1, 2, and 3, have been introduced to increase the capabilities and lifespan of the M1A1 and M1A2. The crew have received better digital maps, better interfaces, an improved cooling system, a remotely operated weapon system, and better front and side armor. But the enhancements themselves are causing problems. The weight of the tank is slowly creeping upwards. The original weight of the M1 was set at 50 tons. Enhancement packages can take the latest version of the M1A2 to well over 70 tons. There is a limit to the amount of improvements that can be made. The more weight the tank is carrying, the less mobile it will be. The more high-technology add-ons and lower-technology armor upgrades that are introduced, the more difficult, costly, and complex it becomes to service the tank. The Abrams is undeniably old, and there is no Abrams replacement yet in sight, meaning the Abrams will have to remain the US main battle tank for many more years. A study in October 2023 by the US Army Science Board concluded that the M1 Abrams would not be sufficient to support combat missions from 2040 onwards. That seems a long way away. But the Abrams is a third-generation main battle tank, and researchers and designers are now contemplating what a fifth-generation tank would look like, and urgently updating these views based on what they are learning from the war in Ukraine. At present, the view seems to be that the new tanks will need to be lighter, with a hybrid propulsion, larger guns, hypersonic missiles, and more effective passive and active protection systems. Advanced radar and sensors will make for a more and more transparent domain, it will become easier to detect weapons, see and strike targets on the battlefield. As we noted earlier, in January 2023, President Joe Biden announced that over 30 Abrams tanks would be sent to Ukraine and that they would be the more up-to-date M1A2 versions. This sent ripples of excitement throughout the Western world and caused serious concern within the Kremlin. In late September 2023, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky confirmed that all 31 had arrived.
Well, first of all, we should probably take a look at the political angles that can dominate and dictate the progress of a conflict. Western countries are generally highly and actively supportive of the Ukrainian cause, but there have also been expressions of concern that Putin should not be overly provoked. This concern has changed slowly. The nature of the brutality of the Russian assault and the extensive numbers of human rights abuses has quickly become clear. Ukraine is fighting for its very existence. Billions of dollars of aid have already been sent to Ukraine. Other weapon systems have followed. Ukraine has received hundreds of armored personnel vehicles, cross-country vehicles, mobile artillery pieces, small arms ammunition, artillery shells, helmets, first aid kits. America and many EU countries have provided intelligence support and military training in a range of ways. One problem is that Ukraine is receiving so many different types of equipment from so many different countries that training, maintenance and logistics are proving a significant challenge. However, this has been slightly alleviated by the high degree of standardization and interoperability between NATO countries, particularly regarding ammunition types. Ukraine was calling for military equipment from as soon as the conflict began in February 2022, but there was reluctance among NATO countries to hand over the most advanced NATO military hardware, such as F-16 fighter jets, main battle tanks, and long-range missiles, for fear of triggering Russian red lines and escalating the conflict. It was only well over a year after the war began that these more advanced systems began to arrive, and the quantities are still very small. 31 Abrams tanks is a relatively small amount, barely two American tank companies or one Ukrainian tank battalion. Being realistic, this is unlikely to make a significant military impact on a battlefield in which thousands of tanks are involved. So what would the strengths and weaknesses of the Abrams look like in a Ukrainian theater of war? The M1A2 and even the M1A1 with a package of upgrades would still present a very formidable opponent to the Russian armor currently being destroyed in their thousands by the Ukrainian army. Most of the tanks fielded by the Russians are upgraded versions of the same T-72 platform that the Abrams easily defeated during the Gulf War. Many are older. Other Russian tanks present, albeit in smaller numbers, are the T-80U and the T-90. The Abrams is more than a match for these vehicles and, in many ways, the Abrams has been training all its life for this battlefield confrontation. There have been many rumors that a highly capable new Russian main battle tank might be entering the Ukrainian battlefields. The T-14, seen on display during Russian victory parades for some years, was reported to be a highly advanced piece of equipment, with a three-man crew and a remote-controlled turret, a new 125mm main armament that can fire anti-tank shells and anti-tank missiles, and carry an extensive array of very modern active defensive measures. This would have made it a fourth or even fifth generation tank, and it could have presented a very serious threat to the Abrams. But these reports seem to have been greatly exaggerated. It now seems likely that only a handful of non-battle-ready unfinished prototypes are in existence, and that the concept may never be put into full production. But let's now take a look at the battlefield environment. It's a high-intensity and high-casualty conflict, which evokes strong parallels from many parts of the last hundred years of warfare. We can see the brutal trench warfare and artillery barrages of the First World War, we can see examples of major armored, mechanized, and airborne operations that could have come straight out of the Second World War. And of course, we can see the cutting-edge technology of the most modern forms of warfare, including guided missiles, drones, electronic countermeasures, combat helicopters, and fast jets. In this mix, the main battle tank has struggled. There have certainly been many long-range instances of tank-on-tank -tank combat, but thousands have fallen victim to artillery, cheap drones, and highly capable, man-portable anti-tank missiles. The vast array of sensors, including drones, satellites, handheld cameras, and social media, make camouflage and concealment of tanks and other armored vehicles very difficult. This combination of threats from drones, artillery, and missiles have caused many analysts to declare that the main battle tank, whether Russian, Ukrainian, or American, is now more or less obsolete. Russian tank and armored fighting vehicle losses have been absolutely staggering. United States intelligence assessments suggest that Russia may have lost 2,300 of the 3,500 tanks they have available. Caller heads have since argued that it's far too early to make that call. Many of the Russian tank losses in particular were due to very poor offensive tactics, low morale, and a major design flaw, with the ammunition automatic loading carousel that effectively has the crew sitting right on top of the tank shells without any protection. The M1A2 would face the full array of combat challenges, just like any other main battle tank. 
drones, trenches, mines, artillery, anti-tank guided weapons, and guided missiles. Mines in particular have greatly reduced the mobility of all combat vehicles. Ukraine is now the most heavily mined place on Earth. On some parts of the front line, as many as five mines have been laid per square meter. But the Abrams is a well-designed and upgraded weapons platform that can move fast, protect the crew, and strike hard at the enemy. What would be crucial in enhancing the performance of the Abrams would be well-trained crews, solid tactics, and reliable maintenance and support. In Iraq, it was clearly demonstrated what happens if you give a top-of-the-range tank to a poorly trained crew with low morale. Giving the Abrams, or the Challenger 2 and Leopard 2 for that matter, to the Ukrainian army would also mean having to ensure that the Ukrainian tank crews, mechanics, and logisticians were also up to the correct standard in order to avoid seeing the tanks abandoned on the battlefield. So far, the Ukrainians have proven themselves highly skilled at adapting to operate many different modern American and European weapon systems, and their morale has always been high. But this does not guarantee success. Offensive combat operations in Ukraine are extremely difficult, dangerous, and costly, as both Russians and Ukrainians have found out. The Ukrainians are now quite realistic about the difficulties, particularly since their summer offensive operations were largely a disappointment, failing to drive the Russians back. America has also sent over 100 Bradley mechanized infantry combat vehicles to Ukraine, the type that accompanied Captain H.R. McMaster's Abrams tanks into the Battle of Easting 73 in 1991. The Ukrainians love them because they offer far superior protection to the crew than any equivalent ex-Soviet infantry combat vehicles could do, but as many as 24 Bradleys have been destroyed when they were used in the Ukrainian summer counteroffensive. The nature of modern warfare means that in order for a ground offensive to have a good chance of success, it needs effective air cover, accurate and responsive artillery support, and timely intelligence. It's a combination of weapon systems working together in close cooperation that wins battles. There are several pieces of American military equipment that will cause Vladimir Putin some major heart flutters. F-16 fighter jets in serious numbers would be one. Long-range guided missiles such as the US MGM-140 Army Tactical Missile Systems, ATACMS, are another. In terms of frontline ground combat, Putin's greatest fear would probably be to see significant quantities of M1A2 main battle tanks by which we mean hundreds rather than dozens arriving in Ukraine. This would mean several things. It would mean that any political concerns about provoking Putin and the strength of the resolve of the United States government would have been resolved in Ukraine's favor. It would show a strong political lead to the rest of Europe. It would reduce issues of training and problems of compatibility if the Ukrainian main tank force was comprised of the same tank type. If several hundred Abrams arrived, it would be fair to assume that they also would come with training, maintenance, and other logistical support packages. There are thousands of Abrams M1A1 and M1A2 main battle tanks in storage in the United States, perhaps not quite an inexhaustible supply, but now probably enough to outnumber Russian tanks on the battlefield. The arrival of M1A2 would provide the Ukrainian armed forces with a war-winning, combat-proven tank that can defeat any Russian tank on the battlefield and give Ukraine a highly capable strike force to allow it to consider serious counterattack options, the Abrams will greatly increase Ukraine's chances of military success. And that is what will keep Mr. Putin awake at night. But what do you think? Will the M1A2 be a game changer for Ukraine in the Russo Ukraine war? Let us know in the comments and don't forget to subscribe for more military analysis from military experts. Once a force to be reckoned with in the global arms trade, Russian weaponry has seen a significant shift. What's behind the decline in Russian arms exports, and who has risen to become the world's second largest arms dealer? And can you guess who's still holding the top position? At the height of the Cold War, one of the major indices of Soviet power was the quantity of arms it exported to the rest of the world. Whether propping up an associate in one of many ongoing proxy wars, bolstering the strength of a member of the Warsaw Pact, or reinforcing the rise of third world tyrants-to-be, there always seemed to be a willing market for the stockpiles of unused Kalashnikovs, MiGs, and T-62s crowding the Soviet Union's many surplus depots. When the USSR collapsed in the early 90s, however, Russian arms exports went into sharp decline. Under the leadership of Russian President Vladimir Putin, the country experienced a temporary resurgence in arms sales throughout the 2000s and 2010s. This upward trend coincided with more frequent military interventions outside Russia's borders, especially in places like Georgia in 2008 and Syria in 2015. 
Smack dab in between these two conflicts, Russian arms exports peaked in 2011, when the country virtually matched American arms exports rifle for rifle, shell for shell, and tank for tank. It did $8 billion worth of deliveries to 35 different countries in that one year alone. For a moment, it looked like Putin really was recapturing the type of geopolitical influence enjoyed by his Soviet forebears. Then in 2014, Putin invaded Ukraine and, well, things started to fall apart. Over the past decade, Russia has witnessed a precipitous decline in arms exports, which by some estimates has contracted as much as 70%. Some analysts call the waning profits and the subsequent loss of prestige one of the many casualties of Russia's war in Ukraine. If the war in Ukraine is partially to blame, it doesn't look like things are going to change anytime soon. Russia can ill afford to export arms to eager buyers around the world if it can barely keep up its own staggering vehicle and equipment losses in Ukraine. The longer the war stagnates, the more equipment Russia will be forced to throw into the meat grinder. The more equipment it consumes, the less there is on the table for Russia to export. It might be simple maths, but it's also a damning equation for the Russian arms industry. Naturally, one man's problem is another man's opportunity. Since the end of the Second World War, there has been an almost immutable balance in global arms exports between the United States, the biggest seller of global arms worldwide, and the Soviet Union, whose mix of high-end aircraft, air defense, and battle tanks, as well as reliable, durable, and cheap small arms weapons, found ready buyers the world over. Now that Russia's declining arms exports have left a vacuum in the marketplace, other arms sellers are eager to fill the void. In fact, in 2021 and 22, Russia was finally surpassed by another nation as the second largest arms dealer on planet Earth. Just who that is might surprise you. Today, let's explore what effect the collapse of the Russian arms industry might have on its near and long-term geopolitical and economic prospects and what Russia's performance in Ukraine might mean for prospective buyers around the globe. It's a demonstrable and somewhat jarring fact that today, the once vaunted Russian military, with its endless reserves of military materiel, is now more dependent on arms sales to China and India than any time since 2003, but at much smaller export volumes, and with both India and China continuing to develop their own import-competing arms industries. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, the economic outlook in Russia looked pretty bleak. Russia had one ace up its sleeve, however. China was experiencing stupendous growth and, as it had during the Cold War, relied heavily on Russian arms sales to sharpen the sword of its growing military until its own GDP, industry, and global industry had reached rough parity with the United States. Between 1990 and 1999, Russia reinvigorated its status itself as a major arms seller on the global stage with a torrent of cheap equipment sales to China and its rapidly growing neighbor India. Military experts have argued that while Russia's arms deals never amounted to more than a small portion of Russia's annual trade exports, between 2-5% overall, it has relied on weapon sales as a metric of soft power, a way to build patronage networks and advance its economic and strategic objectives around the globe. This worked with former Soviet states and power-hungry dictators and revisionist rogue leaders like Syria's Bashar al-Assad and Venezuela's Hugo Chavez but it also worked especially well with Chinese and Indian leaders, who could afford to infuse their military power with the more expensive systems Russia had on offer. There's a reason why the strength of Russia's arms exports have almost become synonymous with the strength of its global military partnerships and alliances. Once you buy a high-tech weapon system from another nation, you essentially lock yourself into a dependability cycle for the long haul. Former U.S. Assistant Secretary of State Andrew Shapiro likened this binding process to the act of buying a modern smartphone. When someone buys a smartphone, they are not simply buying a piece of hardware. They are buying a system that includes the operating system, the system's software for email, photos and music, as well as access to many other available applications. Therefore, an individual is in fact entering into a relationship with a particular smartphone company over the life of that phone. Similarly, when a country buys a fighter jet or other advanced defense systems from a foreign company, they are not just getting the hardware. They are buying a larger system, one that will need to be updated and repaired throughout its lifespan, which in the case of a fighter jet can be as long as 40 years. This means that in purchasing the hardware, the buyer is actually committing to a broader, long-term relationship with the United States. This helps explain why it's been so hard for certain countries to denounce Russia over the past two years, despite the illegality of its invasion of Ukraine, 
Just look at India, whose military stocks are 70 to 80 percent composed of Russian-made equipment. When a nation becomes majorly dependent on foreign arms exports, it becomes exponentially harder to alter the course without severely impairing one's own defense capabilities in the short term. It costs a lot of money, too. Historically, at least, inasmuch as Russia's military could demonstrate its effectiveness on the global stage, it could convince buyers and buyers-to-be that their equipment was worth purchasing, since its botched invasion of Afghanistan, a spate of successful, smaller-scale interventions effectively filled this role, building global confidence in the reliability and utility of Russian weapon systems. Then in 2014, things started to change. Russia informally invaded Ukraine after the Maiden protests, inviting economic sanctions from the West as well as geopolitical pressure on Third World countries to no longer purchase Russian arms. Between 2013 and 2017, Russia enjoyed a share of between a quarter and a fifth of global arms exports and more than 35 customers worldwide. Between 2018 and 2022, that number contracted by one-third, leaving Russia with just 16% of global arms exports and a mere 12 customers. Fast forward to Putin's special military operation, and Russian arms sales reached their nadir. He simply could not afford to sell the systems he soon realized he would need to maintain Russia's stranglehold on what it conquered after February 2022. That year, Russia managed $2.82 billion in arms sales, a paltry sum compared to the nearly $8 billion it was selling a decade prior. Today, France, of all countries, has stepped into the void and has surpassed Russia as the world's second-largest arms exporter, with China taking the bronze in third place. The invasion of Ukraine has cruelly exposed the quality of high-grade and cheap Russian weapon systems alike, like a store's customers passing on discounted bargain bin goods because they can clearly see the product's defects. Russian customers were undoubtedly disturbed by not only the inefficient organization and employment of Russian weapon systems in Ukraine, but the exposure of glaring technical defects and design flaws that resulted in so many tank turrets being hurled into orbit. Russia had to temporarily replace armored losses with new, old-stock BTR-80s, BMP-1s and 2s and those archaic T-62s themselves, ten years older than the first Ford Mustang. The fact that Russia's long-anticipated Armata, Boomerang and Kurganets fighting vehicles have also failed to make an appearance on the battlefields of Ukraine is equally worrying, as it reveals broader industrial bottlenecks that reflect poorly on Russia's ability to deliver what it promises over the long term. Back in 2015, Russia said there would be 1,000 T-14 Armatas in service by 2025. By 2024, that means there should at least be some T-14s in service, right? Yet today, there is still no production line for the Armata, and few, if any, are in the Russian ground forces service. Videos of Russian soldiers complaining of badly rusted rifles, poorly maintained artillery shells, and unserviceable logistics vehicles have also been aired on Telegram and other social media platforms since the conflict began, speaking to the dilapidated state of Russian war materiel. Conversely, think of the benefits reaped by American arms dealers who are receiving real-time endorsements for state-of-the-art weapons being used against a near-peer threat for the first time. The poster child in this example is clearly America's HIMARS system, which has proven so effective in Ukraine that Taiwan, Poland and Australia have not only put in for a new wave of orders, but Germany, yes, Germany, recently agreed to conduct a joint project with Lockheed Martin to create its own version of the platform. It's clear that Russia's customers are beginning to see the writing on the wall. If they are serious about their own defense, they should probably look elsewhere. Many are beginning to recognize that Russia's own defense needs will constrain its ability to fulfill its long-term arms orders. This at least was the conclusion of Serbian President Aleksandr Vucic, who in the aftermath of Russia's November 2022 withdrawal from Kherson, expressed Serbia's need to create its own future with regards to its military capabilities. Armenia recently jumped ship too, criticizing Russia's failure to deliver the goods or offer meaningful support in its war with Azerbaijan. So, when you account for the decreasing dependence of India and China on Russian arms exports over the past decade, the destabilizing nature of events like the COVID-19 pandemic and the poor showing of Russian weapon systems in the ongoing war in Ukraine, you can see why Russian arms exports have taken such a big hit. Today, Russia has an intractable problem. Though it still has plenty of Soviet surplus left over from the Cold War, its foreign customers are increasingly aware of Russia's inability to maintain these aging systems or prevent their descent into obsolescence. 
Likewise, as Russia becomes even more isolated on the global stage, sanctions will restrict access to advanced technologies and components it needs to produce sophisticated weapons. These include the optical systems, bearings, machine tools, engines, and microchips, which have notoriously gone missing throughout Russia. These limitations will undoubtedly affect the competitiveness of Russia's arms in the global market as arms manufacturers prioritize the restocking and rehabilitation of lost or damaged equipment in Ukraine. There have, for instance, been reports in the Russian media that certain arms manufacturers failed to deliver artillery systems for Vietnam or aircraft for Algeria on time. According to a recent CSIS study, in a radical turn of events, Russia has now begun to try to purchase back much-needed military components and technology from countries such as India and Myanmar. Russian tank manufacturers in late 2022 were importing $24 million worth of components simply to cope with requests to modernize telescopic sights and cameras on old models pulled from storage. The more these cases compound, the more Russia's traditional customers will be forced to diversify their suppliers. Vietnam, who has started courting other American, European, and Asian nations to source its military hardware, is one good example. The passage of the 2017 Katza Act by the US Congress in the aftermath of Russia's 2014 annexation of Crimea has also contributed to the decline in Russian arms sales. The act imposed secondary sanctions on countries who engage in significant transactions with Russia's defense sector. Reinvigorated after the 2022 invasion, Katza has disincentivized many recent customers from making Russian weapon orders, adding to the woes of Russia's defense industry. Here's the hard data. As of late 2023, Turkey had a deal in place to buy a series of S-400 SAM systems that has since been put on hold. A deal for 16 Mi-17 helicopters made by the Philippines has since been cancelled. Russia did not make a single delivery to Egypt in 2022. Between 2018 and 2022, combat aircraft and helicopters accounted for roughly 40% of Russian arms sales. By the end of 2022, it had contracted out only 84, compared to 1,371 aircraft and helicopters ordered for the United States and 210 for France. There were only 13 pending deliveries for SAMs by late 2023. There were only 444 pending deliveries for tanks. Serbia cancelled its order of two Ka-32 helicopters owing to Western sanctions and war-related shortages. In 2022, Russia lost the markets of Greece, Cyprus, Finland, and a series of countries in Central and Eastern Europe despite their historical reliance on Soviet and Russian-style systems and repair services. It's customary for nations at war to invest heavily in R&D, refine and improve existing weapon systems, and thus gain an edge over the enemy. Russia's declining arms export profits will severely limit its defense industry's long-term ability to innovate. Instead of advancing the development of its fifth-generation fighters, the Su-57 and Su-75, Russia has had to focus on ensuring it can maintain and replace its current fleet of second, third, and fourth-generation fighter aircraft. As it does so, it will continue to fall behind countries like China, whose R&D expenditures far outmatch Russia's in most categories. If it cannot afford to innovate, Russia runs the risk of repelling additional customers. It's a self-fueling cycle. Today, half of Russia's total arms exports are aircraft, MiG-29s, Su-27s, Su-30s, Su-35s, and Yak-130 jets doled out to Vietnam, China, India, Algeria, and Egypt. Katza sanctions have made it nearly impossible for Russia to find buyers for its most advanced offering, the Su-35, a plane it describes as a fourth-generation plus-plus model owing to the extent of its modifications and modern capabilities. China and more recently Iran are the only markets willing to buy, but Russia can hardly produce enough to warrant a serious bid. Even before the war in Ukraine, Russia only produced five Su-35s in all of 2021. Engines are a big part of Russian exports too, accounting for around 32% of its entire arms trade by late 2023. Russian-made engines extend the service life of Russian military aircraft, especially those currently employed by the Chinese Air Force. Lately, China has looked askance at Russia's ability to deliver the goods on its engine orders. It should surprise no one, but Russia has been struggling to fulfill its engine production quotas because, you guessed it, it relied heavily on Ukrainian manufacturers such as Motor Zish and Zariah Mashproyekt, which used to provide key components in Russia's engine production. According to several analysts, it's likely that the 2022 sanctions regime will further limit the Kremlin's ability to build high-quality aircraft engines in the foreseeable future forcing China to take concrete steps towards the indigenization of the engine industry. 
Could these shortcomings lead to engine trouble for the broader Sino-Russian military alliance? The further you go down the list, the more Russia's issues compound. Russian manpads, anti-aircraft, and guided anti-tank missiles have always been safe purchases for Russia's faithful customers. Yet since the start of the war in Ukraine, Russia has lost hundreds of its own expensive air defense systems and has struggled to maintain the defense industrial capacity required to replace them. Hence, Moscow has to import from China. Russia has lost more than 2,000 tanks in Ukraine, roughly two-thirds of its entire fleet by some estimates, which has put severe pressure on its primary tank manufacturer, Ural Vagonzavod, to replace them. It has 444 tanks on order, but this is far less than the 634 pending delivery from the United States, the 717 pending delivery from China, and the 990 pending delivery from the new boy on the block, South Korea. It's now been almost half a decade since Russia made any notable exports of large naval vessels. Smaller cruisers and patrol ships occasionally come off the line, but Russia's shipbuilding and submarine industry have been forced to work under similar constraints as Western sanctions limit their access to Western components. PR from the sinking of the Moskva and other ships didn't help either. Today, the Russian shipbuilders receive more acclaim for their capacity to produce peerless sunken reefs than their ability to manufacture safe and effective military vessels. Arms exports were once one of the few areas Russia could claim geopolitical parity with the West. No longer. Not only has it fallen behind the United States defense industry over a remarkably short span, it's now witnessing one-time customers like India and China diversifying their sourcing of military equipment and expanding their own arms export capabilities. Putin can expect Russia's arms industry to constrict even further as long as it forges ahead with the long-term occupation of Ukraine. Back in May 2022, Ukrainian officials in Kyiv came up with an ingenious idea. They would take the hulks of burned-out Russian tanks, artillery, anti-aircraft, and infantry fighting vehicles and put on a sort of public exhibition in Mikhailivska Square. In August, an even larger exhibition was held on Kyiv's central Kreschatik Street, this time a display of more than 80 destroyed and captured tanks, howitzers, rocket artillery, and other systems. The destroyed equipment not only served as an important symbol of Ukrainian resistance in the early days of the invasion, it also reflected Ukraine's brilliant use of information warfare. For as we now know, the exhibition was not only a referendum of Russia's ineffective military, but a warning to potential purveyors of its once respected offerings. Buyer beware. So what do you think? Will Putin eventually be able to bounce back when it comes to arms trade? What strategies do you think he will try to employ to revitalize Russia's arms export industry and regain its former prominence? Let us know in the comments and don't forget to subscribe for more military analysis from military experts. How incompetent can Putin get? Since the war in Ukraine started, he's been losing tanks by the dozens on a daily level. His military has been unable to deliver powerful air and artillery strikes or apply modern military tactics and strategies and the list doesn't stop there. When Russia launched its full-scale invasion of Ukraine, the world's attention was naturally riveted on the land war. There, Russia's poor command structure and logistical incompetence became apparent within the first week, with the attack on Kyiv stalling. Since then, Russia has been forced to take hundreds of thousands of casualties in a war of attrition that has raged for 20 months and counting. However, Russia's incompetence has extended to the seas as well. In the build-up to the conflict and early stages of the war, military observers feared that Russia would quickly take control of the seas and stage an amphibious attack on Odessa, Ukraine's third largest city. If Russia took Odessa, it would essentially cut Ukraine off from the Black Sea entirely and leave it a poor, landlocked rump state. Such fears proved unfounded. A landing near Odessa never came. Instead, the biggest stories involving Russia's navy in this war have been of its numerous humiliations. What happened? Today, Russia has essentially ceded control of the Western Black Sea and is increasingly not even safe within its haven in Crimea. But why has the Russian navy proven so ineffective in the war? To be as fair as we can to Russia, it is and always has been in a bad geostrategic position with regards to the sea. Ever since the days of Peter the Great, Russia has aspired to be a sea power. However, geography makes this difficult to do, as its ports are either contained within choke points, freeze over in the winter, or both. The quest for improved access to the sea has been a vital objective for Russia's foreign policy since the early 18th century, and Russia has never quite been able to achieve this goal. Even at the height of its power during the Soviet Union, 
unrestricted access to the sea was an objective that still eluded Moscow. In this light, it is understandable why Russia places such a high strategic importance on Crimea and why it was willing to use military force to secure it. It is one of Russia's few warm water ports. Unfortunately for the Russians, there's a problem. The Turks command the transit points between the Black and Mediterranean seas through their control of the Bosporus and Dardanelles. This control was formalized through the 1936 Montreux Convention regarding the regime of the Straits. The convention allows complete freedom of transit for the commercial vessels of any country through these straits during peacetime. In times of war, however, Turkey, if it is not a party to the conflict, can close the straits to transiting ships unless they are returning to their bases. Three days after Russia invaded Ukraine, Turkey invoked the Montreux Convention's wartime provisions for the first time, refusing Russian naval vessels in the Mediterranean access to the Black Sea. For example, at the end of November 2022, two Russian warships left the Mediterranean through the Suez Canal after nine months of idling after Turkey forbid them from transiting through the Dardanelles and Bosporus to the Black Sea. The effect of the Montreux Convention has been to cut off Russia's ability to reinforce its Black Sea fleet. For Ukraine, this was a significant piece of diplomatic aid. It immediately made Russian naval officers more cautious, knowing that every ship in the fleet was precious. Even so, it seemed far-fetched that Ukraine would be able to significantly impede the operations of the Russian Black Sea fleet. That opinion quickly started to change, however. Ukraine proved its ability to strike at the Russian Navy early in the war. Three days after it invaded Ukraine, and on the same day the Turks invoked the Montreux Convention, Russia captured the strategically important port of Berdyansk. The Ukrainian military and Western observers were understandably concerned that the Russian ships that piled into Berdyansk could either land troops in the rear of Ukraine's southern lines or attack Odessa. Then, at about 7.45 a.m. on March 24, exactly a month after the invasion, the landing craft Saratov mysteriously exploded and sank in port at Berdyansk. Ships of the Saratov's class, the Alligator-class tank landing ship, can land up to 425 soldiers or marines, with armored support of either 40 infantry fighting vehicles or 20 tanks. The loss of this vessel was thus a significant blow to Russia's ability to conduct amphibious operations. How did this happen? From the beginning of the conflict, NATO has provided Ukraine with excellent intelligence, and Ukraine's intelligence units got the word that the Saratov was loaded with munitions at the time of the attack. Ukraine used this intelligence and a Cold War-era Tochka U Scarab short-range ballistic missile to carry out the deed. The Tochka U has a range of about 120 kilometers. We do not know how many of these missiles Ukraine used in the attack, but what is known is that Russia's modern air defense systems should have easily been able to intercept these Soviet weapons. Russian media at the time reported that its forces had done just that, although the real story came in July, when the Saratov was raised from the depths of the sea. Russia's supposedly modern air defense network failed to act against a much older weapon system. Meanwhile, two other ships, the Seza Kunikov and Novichokask, were seen on video departing from the flaming Saratov. They also suffered damage in the attack and were forced to retreat to Crimea. Eleven sailors on board the Saratov died in the incident. Ukraine's next assault on the Russian Navy would become the most famous of the war. This was the sinking of the cruiser Moskva, the flagship of Russia's Black Sea Fleet, in April 2022. This incident was apparently so humiliating for Russia that its Ministry of Defense still offers no details about what happened and avoids talking about it in public to the point that the families of the sailors on board are still left in the dark about the fates of their loved ones. How exactly this incident unfolded is still unclear. After the successful attack, American sources reported that the Ukrainians had used liquid-fueled Neptune anti-ship cruise missiles, sending them to coordinates provided by US intelligence by way of a P-8 Poseidon maritime surveillance aircraft that flew out of Italy and looked around the Black Sea. Ukraine denied this report, however. According to the Ukrainians, April 13, 2022 was the worst day to sink the cruiser because the weather was so bad for such a precise, premeditated attack. The coastline was covered with low, dark rain clouds on that day. The Ukrainian radars in the area had a limited 18-kilometer range because of the bad weather. Knowing this, the Moskva's crew got a wee bit careless. According to Ukrainian sources, at the time of the invasion, we had no over-the-horizon radars and Russia knew it. 
but since the clouds were very low and a signal in this corridor between the water and the clouds had nowhere to go, the radar suddenly reached and identified Moskva. The ship's crew seemingly ignored this potentially deadly situation and were so lax about their security that the air defense systems were inactive. They had not noticed that they had just sailed to within the Neptune's 200-kilometer range. Ukraine may have at this point used a Turkish Bayraktar TB2 drone to distract the Moskva and then launch the missiles. For a while after the attack, Ukrainian crews did not know what happened, but radar soon revealed that four Russian ships were rushing to the Moskva from different directions. Later, the Ukrainians realized that a tugboat had also been dispatched from Crimea, hoping to save the ailing ship. At this point, the weather cooperated again too, when a storm began at sea and made rescue operations much harder. It became impossible to save the Moskva then, and it sank beneath the waves. Hundreds of Russian sailors reportedly saw their flagship get hit by two Neptune missiles. The Moskva incident is more baffling because the ship was an air defense cruiser. If running properly, the Moskva should have gotten as much as four minutes of warning that the Ukrainian cruise missiles were on their way. The Russian cruiser also had a triple layer of protection against such air attacks. Its defenses included the S-300F surface-to-air missiles, 9K-33 OSA air defense missiles, AK-360 close-in 30mm cannons, chaff, decoys, and electronic defense systems. However, no one recorded the Moskva using any of these systems against the Ukrainian cruise missiles. The ship just sat there. Why were none of these systems active? Was the ship's radar system defective? We might never know the answer. Whatever the reason, the Moskva was the largest Russian vessel sunk since World War II and the first loss of a Russian flagship since the Russo-Japanese War. Russia says that 18 crew members died. Other sources say it was as many as 600. Either way, the incident shocked the Kremlin, with Ukraine's demonstrated anti-ship capabilities and no way for it to bring replacements thanks to the Turks' invocation of the Montreux Convention, Russia became even more cautious about how it would use its naval assets. Since this incident, the Black Sea Fleet has been bottled up around its base in Sevastopol, Crimea. With this knowledge, Ukrainian troops confidently strode forward with their Kherson counteroffensive between August and November of 2022 safe in the knowledge that the Russian Navy would not be bothering them with missile attacks from the Black Sea, let alone amphibious operations behind their lines. Even with the Russian Navy's retreat to the relatively safe Crimea, Ukraine wasn't done showing off its prowess in sinking ships. Next up was the rescue tug for Sili Bek. While far less spectacular a target than the Moskva, these tugs are important to the maintenance of a naval fleet. This role is especially important in the Black Sea due to Russia's inability to reinforce its fleet this ship was new too, being launched in 2016 and commissioned in 2017. On June 17, 2022, Ukrainian forces attacked the Vasily Bek when it was on its way to resupply Russian soldiers stationed on Snake Island, a place already made famous from the start of the war when the garrison there used colorful language in response to Russia's demands for surrender. The Ukrainians hit the Vasily Bek with two Harpoon anti-ship cruise missiles. The ship stood no chance and went down, with about 10 Russian KIA in the incident and a $25 million Tor air defense system on board that was supposed to be placed on the island. On June 30th, Russia evacuated its garrison from Snake Island. Moscow claimed that this move was an act of goodwill in recognition of a humanitarian corridor that was part of its grain export deal with Ukraine. In reality, Russia evacuated its troops from Snake Island because the attack on the Vasily Bek made its military brass realize that it's too risky to reinforce and resupply the outpost. It was a tacit admission that Russia had ceded the Black Sea west of Crimea to Ukraine. But the Ukrainians weren't done yet. The Olenogorsky Gorniak, a Raputcha-class landing ship, was Ukraine's next target. On August 4, 2023, Ukraine used drone boats to swarm the ship and its neighbors when it was docked in the Black Sea port of Novorossiysk. Not all the drones made it through Russian defenses, but the attack on the Olenogorsky Gorniak succeeded. The ship did not sink, but it needed to be put in a dry dock to repair the heavy damage. It's unlikely that the ship will return to action anytime soon. The water drone Ukraine used in the attack was a new low-visibility grey boat that can be operated via remote control. The drone boat has a high payload, able to carry a 300kg warhead up to a range of 800km. The boat also features a satellite communications array at its rear. 
A Ukrainian operator of these drones explained their low profile was designed to exploit weaknesses in Russian ship defenses. It was an adaptation from their earlier attacks, where Russian ships spotted drone boats and sank them with artillery and small arms fire once they got to within visual range. The attack on the Olenogorsky Gorniak reveals that Ukraine has absorbed these lessons and is adapting with its newer drone boats. Russia claims that it foiled a similar attack on an oil facility after this incident, but as always these claims should be treated with skepticism. Most recently, Ukraine attacked targets in Sevastopol, the headquarters of Russia's Black Sea Fleet, and other targets in Crimea. On September 13th, Ukrainian forces struck the Sergo Ordzonikidze shipyard in Sevastopol, a major repair base. Ukraine reportedly used 10 Franco-British Storm Shadow cruise missiles in the attack. Russia's Ministry of Defense claims that air defense systems in the area shot seven of these missiles down, but that effort was clearly not enough. The Russian Kilo-class diesel-electric submarine Rostov-on-Don and the large landing ship Minsk were struck and destroyed by the Storm Shadows. Key infrastructure on the base was also damaged in this incident. However, the missile attack was only the climax of the operation. Other units were essential for shaping it. Prior to the attack, Ukrainian special operators seemed to have destroyed one of Russia's nearby S-400 air defense systems and took control of an oil facility that housed a local radar unit. By downing these systems, the Ukrainians set the stage for the strike on Sevastopol. It would only be the first of several attacks on Crimean targets in the weeks ahead. On September 14th, Ukraine again struck at the Russian Navy on the seas. Its general staff said it had targeted two ships in the Western Black Sea and released a video showing a Russian patrol ship appearing to come under attack by drone boats. The Russian Ministry of Defense confirmed that one of its ships, the Sergei Kotov, had been attacked but repelled the assault. Meanwhile, that same day, Ukrainian forces used cruise missiles and drones to destroy a Russian air defense network in the Crimean city of Yevpatoria. Then, on September 22nd, Ukraine launched another attack on Sevastopol. Ukraine sent several Storm Shadow cruise missiles at targets there. Russia claims that it shot most of them down, but one made it through, hitting the Black Sea Fleet's headquarters. The attack set the main building ablaze, and Russian officials said at least one service member went missing in the aftermath. Ukraine alleges that the strike was timed to coincide with a meeting of high-level Russian officials. Kirill Budanov, Ukraine's intelligence chief, says that two Russian commanders were badly injured in the attack. Later, Ukraine's special operations forces said the strike had killed Viktor Sokolov, the commander of Russia's Black Sea Fleet, along with 33 others. No independent source verified this claim, however. Sokolov reportedly attended a soccer awards ceremony to prove he was not dead on September 27th, although there are claims that this was a duplicate. As always, we should know more in time. What we do know is that the Institute for the Study of War confirmed an attack on the 744th Communications Center of the Command of the Black Sea Fleet in Crimea. And the problems are only piling on for Russia. In late September, the Biden administration seemingly finally gave Ukraine what it has wanted for so long. Although it was not officially announced, it's likely that Ukraine will be getting atac ms missiles in the near future. These weapons can hit targets up to 300 kilometers away, 50 kilometers further than the Storm Shadow. And unlike the Storm Shadow, which requires a riskier launch from a fighter jet, atac ms can be fired from Ukraine's HIMARS platforms on the ground. atac ms would be ideal for launching attacks on Sevastopol. Meanwhile, if Ukraine gets atac ms it's also possible that Germany will agree to supply Ukrainians with Taurus air-launched cruise missiles that have even greater range than atac ms This weapon system would be ideal for targeting the Kerch Bridge connecting Crimea to the Russian mainland. A drone attack already damaged the Kerch Bridge a year ago. This scenario would be far more threatening. Ukraine has renewed its attacks on Crimea for a few reasons. First, Russia has allowed the grain export deal that Turkey and the UN brokered in July 2022 to expire. Russia's Black Sea Fleet has resumed its blockade of such exports, making it a more important target for Ukraine to destroy. Crimea is also the linchpin of Russia's logistics in Ukraine. Being able to resupply its troops from Crimea is vital to the Russian war effort. Ukrainian disruption of Russian Navy logistics from Crimea is one of the reasons why Moscow now considers it too dangerous to send ships to the west of the peninsula. An attack on Russia's ports in Crimea would disrupt the supply chain to all the branches of Russia's military, and it appears that the Black Sea Fleet is helpless in stopping such attacks. Crimea is also a highly political target, with Ukrainian President Zelensky saying that this war started in Crimea 
and will end in Crimea. The recapture of Crimea would be the greatest victory for the Ukrainian military, a highly symbolic measure of its triumph. The stakes are just as high, or even higher, for Putin. Prior to the invasion of Ukraine, he sold his occupation and annexation of Crimea to the Russian public as his crowning foreign policy achievement. If Russian occupation of Crimea becomes untenable through missile and drone attacks, and supplying the Russian forces in other parts of Ukraine from Crimea also becomes untenable, Putin's political position at home erodes, and the entire Russian war effort risks breaking down. The war has already put Russia through isolation, economic hardship, and hundreds of thousands of casualties. If Russia cannot gain anything from the hostilities and winds up losing Crimea too, or if it at least cannot use the peninsula for strategic purposes, it's difficult to see how Putin would be able to remain in power, which he plans to do until at least 2036. In this scenario, Russian elites may decide that the time is right for their country to finally get a new leader. There is a presidential election in Russia in 2024. Although elections in Russia are only formalities, the 2024 election could serve as a pretext to oust Putin from power if the war goes too poorly between now and then. It's understandable why Crimea and the Black Sea Fleet would become an increasingly high priority for Ukraine. All wars are first and foremost political. Even if things don't turn out that way, Ukraine's effective neutralization of the Russian Black Sea Fleet is an astounding military achievement. Early in the war, Ukraine forced the Black Sea Fleet to retreat to what it believed was the safety of Crimea. Now, through the actions of its intelligence units, special operators, and missile and air units, it's showing that not even Crimea is safe. If ATAC-Ms and Taurus missiles soon arrive, that point will only be made clearer. What do you think will come next in the war at sea? Will Ukraine soon use ATAC-Ms missiles to destroy Russian ships and docks in Sevastopol? Is the Kerch Bridge safe for Russia? Let us know what you think in the comments. Also, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe for more military analysis from military experts. Why is Putin afraid to deploy the Su-57 to Ukraine? Maybe because much like its land-based counterpart, the T-14 Armata, it's one of the most oversold and disappointing assets within the Russian military. Then there's the fact that Ukraine has been successfully shooting down so many Russian jets that Putin is terrified of his shiny new toy being captured and having its true RCS revealed by the West, as well as the release of any other advanced capabilities, or lack thereof. Let's dive in. When it comes to recent Russian military equipment, there are two things to remember. First, don't believe the hype. And second, make sure your accountant checks the numbers. One of the most overhyped and underwhelming members of the new Russian military is the Su-57 fighter, codenamed Felon by NATO. That codename may be its coolest feature. It promises a lot but delivers much less. What's even more surprising is the way that Russia has been shielding this aircraft from potential risk in the skies near Ukraine. We say near since there's no evidence yet that Russia has risked flying the aircraft anywhere but within Russian airspace, except for a very few brief appearances over much less dangerous Syrian airspace. During those brief deployments in 2018, the Su-57 was still considered a prototype and was described by aviation expert and author Tom Cooper as burdened with inadequate and incomplete sensors, incomplete fire control systems, and self-protection suites no operational integrated avionics, and unreliable engines. Despite its clean lines, impressive maneuverability, and eye-catching paint schemes, this aircraft falls short in many vital areas, including less than stellar stealth capabilities. Its use of outdated engines, a reliance on less than state-of-the-art computer systems, and extremely limited production numbers. Much like the more capable US-made F-22 Raptor and F-35 Lightning stealth fighters, the Su-57 ran into extensive development delays and cost overruns, but unlike the F-22 and F-35, the final aircraft has not lived up to pre-production hype. Actually, we can go as far as to say the Su-57 isn't even comparable to the F-22 and F-35. Here's why. The design and layout of the Sukhoi Su-57 Felon is an evolution of the previous Soviet Union's Su-27 shape adapted for the requirements of low visibility and supersonic speed and agility. In many Western circles, the Su-57 has been described as a stealth flanker, the flanker being the NATO designation for the Su-27. Both planes are twin-engine, twin-tailed planes, with an emphasis on being multi-role aircraft, 
meaning they can handle both air superiority roles as well as being able to strike ground targets with onboard munitions. The Su-57 began development in the early 2000s and has been delayed several times. Its original prototype was expected to make its maiden flight back in the year 2007, but numerous problems with its design have caused equally numerous delays. While its engines are essentially the same as those of the aircraft it's designed to replace, the Su-35S, their implementation has not gone well. At first, the Russians refused to acknowledge that their new jet had a development problem. Finally, in late 2009, the Russians admitted that problems with the engine were causing the delays. The original concept for the Su-57 was for the plane to use the newly designed and more powerful Izdalai 30 engines. However, nearly all the prototypes and production models released so far are equipped with the same engine used on the existing Su-35S, the AL-41 engine. The reason the Izdalai 30 engines haven't been used yet is due to reliability and quality control issues, which have yet to be ironed out. Beyond those problems, both the AL-41 and the Izdalai 30 are nothing more than a slightly updated and heavier version of the AL-31 engine, which was designed back in the 1970s. That the Su-57, designed to be the best frontline fighter for the latter half of the 2020s, flying with what are effectively 50-year-old engine designs is just one of the plane's troubles. The other problem that carries over from the earlier AL-31 engine is its propensity for catching fire. The Russian plane that sported the majority of these engines, the MiG-31, has a history of crashes due to engine fires, and the AL-41 used in the Su-57 seems to have inherited that engine fire gene. The very first serial production example, Su-57, crashed in 2019, due to what Russian state-run media outlet RIA Novosti said was a mishap occurred during an engine test, or a potential failure in the Su-57's engine control system, but Russian news agency TASS reported that it was a flight control system error. This possible engine fire followed one of the type's T-50 prototypes that was badly damaged due to an engine fire in 2014. These engine problems, along with unanticipated structural fatigue in the fuselage and wings, caused a redesign that included more carbon fiber material, a reinforced airframe, and an enhanced wingspan. These additions raised the overall weight of the Su-57 to more than 25 tons, which further reduced its performance on its older engine models and led to additional crashes during testing. These changes and additions delayed the expected first delivery model from 2015 all the way to 2020. The Su-57 was expected to be Russia's entry into what's known as a fifth-generation fighter. These types of planes, including the earlier US-made F-117, more of a stealth testbed than an actual fifth-gen fighter, and the much more advanced F-22 Raptor, introduced several new concepts into the aviation industry. These new benchmarks included advanced stealth, or in the case of the Su-57, stealthier, airframes with reduced radar cross-section (RCS). Active Electronically Scanned Array AESA, radar, a type of phased array antenna, and supercruise capabilities, which means a fighter can fly above Mach 1 without using afterburners. In comparison, the US-made F-22 is able to cruise at speeds of Mach 1.5 or greater without the use of afterburners for extended periods in combat configuration. The Su-57 does hit most of the 5th gen benchmarks reasonably well. However, it's in the realm of stealth capability that the Su-57 has been heavily criticized. It certainly falls far short of its US counterparts when compared against the F-22 and F-35. Russian aviation expert Pyotr Batowski points out in his book Russia's Warplanes Volume 1 that the primary means of reducing radar visibility is to carry normally wing or belly-mounted munitions in the interior of the plane. External weapons and extra fuel tanks, along with the racks with which they are attached to the plane, dramatically increase the radar cross-section of a plane. Mounting those internally removes those obstructions, but the improvement comes at a cost. For one, it means the plane can carry fewer of these add-ons, while it also means the airframe must be bigger and wider, which leads to an increased weight, which requires a more powerful engine, or in the Su-57's case, dual engines. That double-engine design also means the plane is more susceptible to infrared heat-seeking missiles. It also means the external exhaust nozzles increase the radar cross-section on their own. That problem can be countered by embedding the exhaust within the body of the airframe, which both the F-22 and F-35 do remarkably well, but the Su-57 doesn't even try to hide its dual exhausts, making it more observable to enemy detection. 
There's also the need to deal with the straight lines for the engine intakes, as well as the turbine blades just inside those air ducts. Again, the F-22 and F-35 have been designed not just with embedded fan blades, making them almost undetectable by enemy radar, but the intakes are also covered in radar absorbent material. The Su-57 employs radar blockers to reduce reflections from the engine inlet guide vanes and are installed in the engine air intake ducts, but they don't do enough to remove that radar return. The shape of the airframe has been designed to reduce the number of directions in which electromagnetic waves are reflected, including blending the wings into the airframe's body, which helps increase the plane's stealthiness. But there are other problems with the plane that add to its lack of stealthiness. One glaring problem is that the entire plane isn't coated in radar-absorbent materials, which the F-22 and F-35 have. The Su-57 does have a paint job that many warplane simulation enthusiasts think is really awesome and super cool looking, but it does nothing to hide the plane from enemy radar. What's even worse is that the Su-57 has exposed rivets all across the plane, especially on its wings. Those dramatically increase the plane's radar signature, making the plane stand out in real combat. The Russian-leaning website MilitaryWatchMagazine.com, always quick to criticize Western military technology while simultaneously lauding Russian ones, claims the Su-57 is built with a unique blend of low-reflectivity fiberglass, which was offered as a beneficial alternative to the more radar-absorbent stealth coatings used on US and Chinese stealth aircraft, due to its much lower maintenance needs. But the number of problems with this type of an airframe, as seen in the efforts to strengthen and improve the plane after it was supposed to be ready for combat trials, shows that this method of construction presents its own inherent weaknesses. The plane's manufacturer Sukhoi claims the Su-57 has an optimal radar cross-section between 0.1 to 1 square meters. For comparison, the F-117 had a radar cross-section of around 0.003, about one-third as much as an ordinary bird while the F-35 has an RCS of 0.005 and the F-22 has an RCS of 0.001, which is somewhere around 1,000 to 10,000 times smaller than the Su-57's RCS. In comparison, a B-52 bomber has a radar cross-section rating of 100, an Su-27 has a rating of 15, an F-16, flying clean, meaning without external weapons and fuel tanks, has a 5, a MiG-21 has a 3, an F-16C has a 1.2, an FA-18 has a 1.0, and the SR-71 Blackbird has a 0.01, which is about the same as an average bird. The F-35's radar cross-section has been compared to a hummingbird, while the F-22's cross-section has been compared to that of a bumblebee. To understand the real-world difference, Russia's standard surface-to-air system, the S-400, uses a 91N6E search radar, which has a detection range of about 240 miles against a target of 4 square meters. If it's operating under optimal conditions, it should be able to detect an F-15 at 325 miles, an F-A-18E Super Hornet around 1 square meter RCS, at 170 miles, the Su-57 assuming 0.1 square meter RCS at 96 miles, and an F-22 or an F-35 with an RCS of 0.005 or less at only around 17 miles. In short, a radar would have between 6 to 10 times greater detection range against the Su-57 compared to an F-22 or an F-35. Russia's problem is that many Western analysts don't believe that the 0.1 RCS that the plane's manufacturer Shukhoi claims to have is accurate. If it's found to be closer to 1 or even higher, then its capabilities as a stealth fighter dramatically decrease, which means bad things for Russia's ability to sell the plane overseas to its usual markets like India and China. All of this leads to the question, if the Russians are so positive the Su-57 is the equal of the F-22 and is the best aircraft Russia has ever built, why are they so reluctant to use it in the current invasion of Ukraine? It's been a glaring issue for the Russian military that they haven't yet established air control over the Ukrainian battlefield, something that their much larger air force was intent on demonstrating from the earliest days of the fighting. The answer is a simple one, though with complicated ramifications. Russia doesn't want to fly one of its very limited number of state-of-the-art aircraft for fear of having it shot down. The risk of having the Su-57 captured and thereby having its true RCS revealed by the West, as well as the release of any other advanced capabilities or lack thereof, is one reason why Russia has been so reluctant to deploy the plane over Ukrainian territory. For a country that has a much smaller and more outdated air force, Ukraine has done a remarkable job of shooting down Russian aircraft and helicopters. 
As of March 2023, Ukraine had shot down 70 Russian fighter aircraft, at the loss of only 60 of their own. And that's not including one disastrous day for Russia, when on May 15, 2023, they lost two fighter jets, an Su-34 and an Su-35 plus two Mi-8 helicopters, all within 12 hours, and all within the Russian territory of Bryansk. The fact that Russia lost multiple downed aircraft within Russian territory all at the same time was a stunning blow to their air force. Some Western analysts believe Ukrainian air defense systems might have been pushed closer to the border with Russia to engage aircraft that direct their attacks from within Russian borders. The Russian Air Force has recently begun using more glide munitions, which are bombs with pop-out fins that can strike targets at a greater distance. Ukrainian Air Force spokesman Yuri Inat explained after the May 15th incidents that Russian airplanes regularly attack Ukraine from Russian territory. He said their strike air group attacked Ukraine from the north from Bryansk Oblast. They do this almost every day. They carry out strikes with guided bombs. Another black day for Russian military aviation was June 24, 2023, the day of the abortive rebellion by Yevgeny Prigozhin's Wagner mercenary group. In less than 24 hours, Prigozhin's men managed to shoot down seven combat helicopters, as well as one of Russia's most valuable air assets, an Il-22M airborne command post. It is believed that all of the pilots and personnel on board the eight aircraft were lost. The fact that all of these planes were within Russian airspace shows just how dangerous the invasion against Ukraine has been for the Russian Air Force. The open-source combat tracker Oryx says that the Russian aircraft losses are even higher, confirming that they've lost, at a minimum, 77 fixed-wing aircraft as of July 14, 2023, with another 90 helicopters lost. Oryx's numbers are based only on confirmed losses, so the total number of Russian airplanes lost is almost certainly even higher. Another of the major problems with the Su-57 is that there just aren't very many of them available for the Russian Air Force. The West's best estimates are that Russia has only received somewhere between 5 and 15 of the aircraft, with most analysts suggesting Russia is currently flying a total of only 12 felons. Even TASS, the Russian news agency, says a best-case scenario would see Russia possibly receiving as many as 76 Su-57s, but only by the end of 2028. And that's assuming a big ramp-up of production that Russia's economy doesn't appear likely to meet. These numbers pale in comparison to the number of F-22 Raptors that the US currently has flying, which includes 142 combat aircraft and another 44 used for training and testing new equipment and upgrades. Even more impressive is the number of F-35 Lightnings currently flying. The US alone is operating more than 450 F-35s in its three configurations, the original A version, the vertical short takeoff and landing, VSTOL B version, and the carrier C version. But the F-35's true advantage is the ability to sell these aircraft to America's allies. When you include those countries, there are currently more than 850 F-35s in service around the world, and the US is producing another 156 more of these planes every year. One of the problems that Russia has had in producing the Su-57 has been a lack of overseas partners. One of its original allies in this program was going to be India, who had agreed with Russia back in 2016 to create an improved Su-57 that would have been called the Fifth Generation Fighter Aircraft Program, or FGFA. But years of delays and concerns that the FGFA would not meet project goals led India to put the program on indefinite hold in 2018. India complained that the base Su-57 was too expensive, poorly engineered, and powered by old and unreliable engines. The degree with which India was unhappy with the Su-57 is borne out by the fact that India willingly walked away from the project after already dropping $295 million into pre-development costs, money they'll never get back. With India's departure from the program, Russia lost the largest potential buyer of any future Su-57 aircraft, which meant that Russia will have to bear the cost of developing and producing the aircraft alone. Another potential buyer, Algeria, has a contract to acquire Su-57s in 2025, but that deal may also fall through because Russian firms will not risk having them flight tested on site in Algeria, and Algeria doesn't trust Russia, to be honest, about any tests done in Russian airspace. Instead of working with Russia for its next aircraft, India has announced an agreement to buy the fourth-gen Rafale fighter from France and has placed an order for 26 of the aircraft, as well as three Scorpene-class submarines. These purchases show how far India has gone to diversify its armaments purchases, while also distancing itself from Russian arms manufacturers. 
China has already said no to the Su-57, as it's developing its own fifth-gen stealth fighter, the J-20 Super Dragon, which itself will eventually be replaced by an even better model, their as-yet-unnamed sixth-gen advanced stealth fighter, which is still under development and not expected to see full production until sometime after 2026. Then there's Russia's failed export sale of existing Su-35 planes to Iran. They had a deal in place for Iran to purchase up to 50 already built Su-35s, an agreement concluded in 2014 during the second term of President Hassan Rouhani. According to a former Iranian diplomat, at the time of purchase Russia had promised to deliver the Su-35s in 2023, but neither Iran nor Russia is expecting the planes to be delivered this year. Whether the unexpected loss of so many aircraft in the Ukraine invasion is to be blamed for this delay, or as some have speculated, Israel was able to dissuade Russia from sending Iran the planes, is still a matter of speculation. Either way, not sending aircraft that have already been paid for sends a strongly negative signal to any other potential buyers of Russian armaments. Which leads us to our next question, posed by many Western commentators. Is the Su-57 actually the worst stealth fighter in any modern air force? When taking into account its comparatively poor RCS, its unreliable engines, its pitifully small production numbers, and its reliance on fiberglass framing instead of stealth coating, it seems that it's not really even comparable to the current best stealth aircraft, the F-22 and the F-35, and might even be considered less satisfactory than the Chinese J-20, which seems to many analysts to be a pirated copy of the F-22 Raptor built with stolen technology. Henry Kelsall, military analyst and aviation expert, says, Russia's Su-57 Felon is a troubled aircraft and a poor stealth fighter with an abnormally high radar cross-section and just 10 in active service. He adds, it's an aircraft that should have stealth capabilities, but the Su-57 falls remarkably short in this area. Aircraft such as the F-22 Raptor and F-35 Lightning II have it beaten in this department. As such, it's arguable that the Su-57 is the world's worst stealth aircraft currently in service. Russian President Vladimir Putin, on the other hand, seems to be willing to claim it's not only not that bad, but that the Felon is the best stealth fighter in the world. This is the world's best plane by all its operational characteristics and its armament, Putin said about the Su-57, according to a report broadcast by Russian news agency TASS. No other aircraft in the world can fly as well as our plane. This is the true reason why Russia can't afford to have one of their few Su-57s shot down. If the West were to get their hands on a shot-down felon and discover, as many analysts have pointed out, that this plane is nothing more than a souped-up fourth-gen fighter, then its chances of ever being sold to overseas buyers would vanish in a heartbeat. The aviation writer, ex-Marine and foreign policy and defense technology analyst Alex Hollings says, The Su-57 isn't quite as advanced, quite as capable, or quite as stealthy as the other three fighters of its generation. As far as their effectiveness in the Ukraine invasion, he added, to date there are so few Su-57s in existence that any capability they offer the Russian military is superficial at best. Russia will likely keep the felon within its own territory and will only operate it when the plane is out of Ukrainian surface-to-air missile range, which is from 60 to 90 miles. A shootdown of the vaunted Su-57 would be a terrible blow to Russia and a public relations bonanza for the Ukrainians and its allies in the West. So whether its stealthiness is as bad as its many detractors suggest, the Su-57 Felon is one plane that Ukraine will probably never see flying through the skies. But what do you think? Will Putin ever send the Su-57 into battle? If so, do you think it will live up to the hype he's generated around it? Let us know in the comments and don't forget to subscribe for more military analysis from military experts. Is Ukraine slowly cooking up a pot of Putin's ultimate defeat? There's a popular metaphor which compares a frog to a leader or an organization. As the story goes, if a frog is thrown into a pot of boiling water, it will immediately sense danger and leap to safety. However, throw the same frog in a pot of lukewarm water and increase the temperature one degree at a time, and it won't sense danger until it's too late. The meaning is clear. Unless individuals and organizations exercise constant vigilance and adapt to changing circumstances, they can lead themselves into a proverbial pot of hot water, irreversible danger with terrifying consequences. Some experts believe this metaphor applies equally to the ongoing conflict in Ukraine. Last year, after easily overrunning cities like Kharkiv and Kherson, Putin's forces perhaps thought it would be easy to continue the offensive and consolidate their gains. Their failure to topple Zelensky's regime 
and serious and recurring logistical problems opened a window of opportunity for Ukraine to seize the initiative. This they did, gradually applying offensive pressure on all fronts, and here is where they began to increase the operational tempo, fainting one way, then boldly attacking another until the operational waters reached their boiling point. Russian troops quickly discovered their positions were untenable, they weren't prepared for the breakthrough in Kharkiv or the more measured collapse of their hold on Kherson until it was too late. Like a frog unable to perceive the slowly but steadily rising temperatures of the water it found itself immersed in, Putin's strategy to wait and see founded during those dual debacles, in sore need of new conscripts, the frontline troops he did have were effectively boiled in the crucible of war, some proverbially, others, well, literally. Their positions were impossible to sustain, and consequently, they were left with little recourse but to withdraw. Now that the war's front lines have by and large stagnated, some say Ukraine is subtly attempting to bring the water to a boil in other strategic areas. While most observers freely admit Ukraine's 2023 counteroffensive has fallen short of its intended objectives, could a boil the frog strategy still be in play in places like, say, Crimea? Join us today as we explore this issue. Military organizations, more than perhaps any other, are incentivized to adapt to the changing conditions. Their very survival depends on it. Even those as demonstrably inept as Russia's have shown, from time to time, some measured capacity for adaptability over the past year. Putin's forces seem to have wised up after their embarrassing setbacks at Kharkiv and Kherson. Ukraine's relatively unknown offensive capabilities were put on full display, and as Russia's own offensive might have culminated in a series of multi-pronged yet misguided ventures, it opted to consolidate and defend the cities it had captured rather than extend its neck deeper into the Ukrainian vice. This resulted in the strategic decision to sit back and create a defensive network it could viably hold in the event of the anticipated Ukrainian counteroffensive. And to their credit, the defensive networks they constructed were said to rival some of those found during World War I, more than a century prior. But Russia has not forsaken offensive operations altogether. More recently, We've watched as Russia has started the slow transition from defensive to offensive operations of their own, a half year after their somewhat pyrrhic victory at Bakhmut in May 2023. Looking back on that attritional struggle, it's strange to contemplate why Russia placed so much strategic value on a city as devastated as it was. In the end, entirely bereft of infrastructure, resources and political influence. Sure, Prigozhin got his day in the sun, but like Icarus, perhaps in the end, he flew too close. In some sense, the immense bloodletting in Bakhmut played into Ukrainian hands. While they prepared their forces to strike on the southern axis, they opted to remain on the defensive for much of the Bakhmut battle. Letting Putin press more and more forces into the crucible there deprived him of stronger defenses elsewhere. Like hanging a carrot in front of a donkey, the Ukrainians gambled away Bakhmut in the hope Putin's wagon, firmly tied onto a strategically bankrupt position, would spread Russian troops across a wider frontage and thus create the conditions for success elsewhere. It was a decision in line with the past successes, a bait-and-switch not unlike the priming operations preceding the Kharkiv and Kherson victories. We now know this gamble didn't entirely pay off. Penetrating prepared defenses without air superiority is inarguably the most difficult operation Ukraine could have undertaken, barring, say, a full-blown amphibious assault across the Dnipro River. Yet, mounting domestic and international pressure gave the AFU little other option but to go for it, and their counter-offensive, inching forward yard by yard, has suffered, though not failed, in the bitter cauldron awaiting them. Russia might be able to relate now that they've had a chance to both hold on to Bakhmut and stage new offensives of their own in Avdivka of late. Avdivka comparatively holds far more significance than Bakhmut, owing to its proximity to Donetsk. For more than a month, Russia went pedal to the metal there, committing something like eight brigades, with complements of armor, trucks, and mechanized vehicles, and sustained some of the heaviest casualties of the year, according to British intelligence agencies. When you consider how many Russians were killed in Bakhmut and Fuladar earlier this year, that observation is startling. When you consider how far they actually managed to get in Avdivka, that is to say, not far at all, it becomes even more significant. Like it has from the beginning, personnel issues have been Russia's Achilles heel not necessarily in quantity, where there seems to be an endless stream of contract soldiers and conscripts being flung into battle, but in quality. According to one Russian blogger, an expert on operations in the Donbass, who writes under the pseudonym Wayne Howell, the recent recruitment of contract soldiers from underprivileged social groups, 
pales in comparison to the caliber of professionals and enthusiasts enlisted at the beginning of the full-scale invasion. Howell cites several startling anecdotes to illustrate just how stark the golfing quality has become over the past two years. There is excessive drinking among new recruits, something he claims regularly leads to their deaths and serious injuries. Examples include fatal instances where a Ural off-road vehicle was driven off a cliff, a soldier fell from a tank and was crushed beneath the tracks of an infantry fighting vehicle, or a recruit sustained a severed arm while playing with an RPG. Rampant alcoholism and an endemic lack of discipline have forced Russian officers into dire straits to maintain order and control. Many, according to Howell, resort to physical punishment, violence, and threats of execution. There are other metrics of quality available to intelligence analysts. You have, for example, men like Nikolai Ogolobyak, a convicted Satanist involved in ritual murders of four teenagers in 2010, who was pardoned after only six months on the front line. Another recruit, Denis Gorin, who was serving a light 22-year sentence for, I kid you not, murder and cannibalism, was recently wounded and will more than likely be released upon recovery. No wonder we see Russian soldiers regularly abandon wounded comrades in arms in their time of need. All of this comes, predictably, with a severe downtick in motivation, which, in turn, results in a market inability to achieve noticeable results on the front line. We've seen a return to Wagner tactics, recruit the worst of the worst, amalgamate them into Storm Z units, and throw them in waves at the nearest hellhole. This lack of professionalism, Howell and other experts claim, is what's preventing Russian forces from eliminating the Ukrainian foothold on the Kherson axis. Despite continuous airstrikes for two weeks and the deployment of additional naval infantry units, Ukraine continues to creep toward the M14 Belt Highway, a lifeline of Russian supply to Novokokovka. If they cut it off, the Russian situation there may grow even more untenable. The water temperature is rising degree by degree. But back in Avdivka, you might say, Russians did manage to enter the industrial zone, didn't they? Yes, but only at the cost of a third wave of assaults, resulting in significant military losses without yielding substantial gains. So here we are. Russia is raging against the machine. Wading through minefields and mud, the offensive potential of the AFU is likewise mostly depleted, and it has real resource constraints to deal with over the winter. The tempo of frontline operations has slowed dramatically. Advances are now measured in hundreds of meters at best, and contested territories regularly change hands. Most fighting occurs at the platoon and assault group level, involving only a few soldiers rather than entire battalions. Soldiers mostly remain in trenches, and according to one commentator, achieving any substantial gains with such small groups of men is virtually impossible. Where does that leave Russia? They will continue to try and encircle Avdivka, but with the shadow of Bakhmut looming over the battlefield, there is no guarantee even if they capture it, they'll be able to hold it. As at Bakhmut, Ukraine will not go gently into that good night. They will thrash and flail and rail and defend with all their might and likely, in the process, not only inflict thousands more Russian casualties, but keep them tidily localized in the east. Where does that leave Ukraine? Truthfully, a prolonged defense of Avdivka counterintuitively works in their favor if their ultimate military strategy remains focused on someday recapturing Crimea. The only way they can actually achieve this is if they manage to isolate and cut the land bridge it enjoys with Russia. According to Ed Arnold, a research fellow at Britain's Royal United Services Institute and ex-infantry officer, Ukraine now knows how Russia fights and have learned how to manage Russian offensive operations and mitigate their threat while undergoing the requisite period of regeneration. Notably, Arnold believes it's premature to claim Ukraine's counteroffensive has both come to an end or resulted in failure. One of the issues, he said in an interview, is that we try to measure success on the expectations which are far too high anyway. Actually, it's less about the whole territory that's been liberated over the last five months, and it's more about where it is. They are pressing towards Tokmak, a crossroads on the road to the Sea of Azov. They are making limited river crossings over the Dnipro River, straining the Russian flank. And so, if they continue edging towards this critical overland supply passage while Russia commits massive formations in places like Avdivka, you introduce the possibility of isolating Crimea. Russia will be forced to fill gaps rather than having time to reconstitute defensive lines. And when you factor in what's been going on in the Black Sea, operations integral to Ukraine's military strategy but whose impact is rarely visible on the map, 
where persistent drone attacks have forced Russian ships to virtually leave Sevastopol and stage further afield from the battlefield, what the UK Defence Minister recently labelled the functional defeat of the Black Sea Fleet has made the pot just another degree hotter for the Russian frog. In the long run, we may look back on the 2023 Ukrainian counteroffensive in far different terms than many commentators are bandying about today. Not a disappointing anticlimax, but a vital preparatory phase to the very difficult task before them in 2024. In Ukraine's boiling the frog strategy, the jewel is Crimea. It is Putin's darling, but rather than assaulting it militarily, which would more than likely result in an unthinkable military disaster, Ukraine may be able to incrementally increase pressure by layering its ongoing operations, full front engagement, intelligence penetration, partisan warfare, drone attacks, depriving the Black Sea Fleet any room for maneuver, the occasional drone strike on Russia itself, these all limit options Putin enjoys, and eventually could make it simply untenable to retain its hold on Crimea, similar to the way Russia's presence in Afghanistan eventually became untenable. Ukraine's access to Western munitions and materiel will weigh heavily in the final outcome of this struggle. The provision of long-range missile systems like the Atakams have already proven to be devastatingly effective. For several weeks, a spate of reports revealed a series of highly destructive strikes carried out against Russian targets, forcing Putin's senior military officials to wrestle with the question of balancing the need to withdraw certain priority targets beyond the reach of Atakam's missiles, while continuing to provide the necessary support for forces engaged in bitter fighting along the front lines of the war. Unlike weapon systems like the Paladin, HIMARS, cluster munitions, or the F-16 M1 Abrams or M2 Bradley, Atakams were sent to Ukraine without much fanfare or announcement. Ukraine benefited from this decision, using the element of surprise to mount overnight attacks on Russian airbases in mid-October 2023 to devastating effect. Russia now knows the impact of these missile systems. Ukraine knows it must continue to nurture its pipeline of long-range munitions for the short and distant future. Underpinning it all is the outsized impact of these extended-range weapons in Ukrainian hands. It affects the immediate tactical calculus of Russian officers who, left with no real answer, had to virtually push their highest-value targets further and further back from the front lines, under the threat of HIMARS, and now even further with Atakams. Strategically, Ukraine will have to make a conscious decision to expend its precious supply of these munitions throughout the winter in order to degrade logistics hubs, trench-digging equipment, ammunition dumps, and command and control nodes that will be vital in defending the path to Crimea. There is an even longer range and more persistent threat Russia must contend with, partisan warfare and special operations in Russian-controlled territory. Ukraine's intelligence network is incredibly capable and has a deep bench of contacts both within and without the Russian Federation. These networks have occasionally made their presence known throughout the conflict, targeted assassinations of pro-Russian occupation officials, car bombings, drone strikes and cross-border incursions into Russia itself, and even recent reports of Ukrainian Special Forces units masterminding drone strikes on Wagner PMC units operating in Sudan. These attacks send a clear message. Ukraine can strike anywhere, everywhere, and without prejudice if it has to. It's another part of the layered approach at the heart of Ukraine's boil the frog strategy, another gradually compounding factor which will make holding areas like Crimea more and more difficult as time goes by. Eventually, Putin will be left with two choices. Withdraw from eastern Ukraine and eventually Crimea itself, a very unlikely outcome, or reinforce his present positions even more than he already has. Crimea's vulnerabilities are well known to the Ukrainians. They are just waiting for the right opportunity and delivery system to put another munition on the Kerch Bridge mounting the pressure to force Putin to reinforce the region at the expense of other fronts. This is why the Tokmak Axis was Ukraine's major axis of attack. Control the railways there, and you can virtually control the movements in and out of Crimea. In this case, it's not even vital that they reach the Sea of Azov itself for this strategy to achieve its intended effect. It just has to imperil Russia's lateral lines of communication to the extent that its position in southeastern Ukraine becomes untenable and leaves Crimea more vulnerable to layered attacks. If Putin is indeed playing the long game, there's a lot he'll have to consider. Yes, Russia has far more territory than it did in 2014, but holding on to that territory so ineffectively, in a way that has fully telegraphed its true military potential to the entire world, 
has come at a high cost. Everyone, Russia included, knows it will not be able to stage amphibious offensive operations on the scale it did in 2022, again, for several years minimum. Blunted in Bakhmut, bloodied in Avdivka, if Russia continues to harbor the frankly insane offensive ambitions that it has in 2023, it will only become more and more difficult to hold on to territory it has gained. There have been intonations in certain Russian camps that several senior officials favor some sort of ceasefire. As conditions have stalemated, Belarusian President Alexander Lukashenko has also called for a ceasefire, though his opinion isn't worth much in Kremlin circles. Recently, he pointed out how there are enough problems on both sides and, in general, the situation is now seriously stalemated. No one can do anything to substantively strengthen or advance their position. Notably, this was actually the first time he'd stepped out and sought a truce to end the conflict. Zelensky has put forward a 10-point plan and there have, to date, been three rounds of peace talks with both sides and representatives from across the globe, putting out feelers as to the feasibility of making it work in theory. In practice, Zelensky has shown zero indications he believes Russia will legitimately adhere to any form of peace accords they agree on. The Russian Federation has no international legitimacy in keeping its word. Until they change, the fighting continues. Both leaders are watching the outcome of the looming US presidential election with a sense of uncertain foreboding. On its outcome rests the future of American material assistance to Ukraine, the posture of the West's foremost member toward Russia as a member of the liberal international order, and if Trump is re-elected, perhaps Putin's best chance of reaching terms amenable to him while holding onto territory he has captured. Noted British historian and Russian expert Mark Galliotti has recently claimed that for both sides, Crimea will serve as the major bargaining chip on the peace table. From before 2014, everything, including the Russian occupation of Luhansk and Donetsk, has evolved around Crimea. Putin has stated unequivocally that Crimea is a major red line and that any immediate threat to it will result in a major escalation. Figuring out how to threaten Crimea in the most effective manner possible will continue to occupy Ukrainian military planners. Geographically, it is a formidable target, rimmed by the sea, marshy and difficult to traverse in the north, and relatively narrow in terms of land frontage for an amphibious assault in the south, all virtually make direct assaults out of the question. That leaves the boil the frog strategy. Gradual pressure on many fronts not only isolates the region, but removes the immediate escalatory potential of Putin's imaginary red line. Ukraine will likely also have to figure out how to bring synergistic systems like the Atakams, F-16s, and its surviving Western armor to bear. What is reassuring is that Ukraine's layered approach has had a tangible impact on Russia's operational outlay. It has had to bring so many of its vaunted S-400 air defense systems forward to protect high-value targets that it has left Moscow and many parts of Russia almost entirely deprived of air defenses of their own. Scarcity, both of military systems and equipment, is evident on every hand. Political pressure is also mounting, far more demonstrably, in 2023 than it was in 22. Ukraine enjoys the same advantages of other underdogs throughout history. That is, for the foreseeable future, it doesn't have to necessarily deliver a war-winning blow or destroy the entirety of the Russian armed forces on the battlefield. It just has to not lose. Many will try to tell you the conditions are the same for Russia, but don't be fooled. It was the invader, it remains the occupier. Much like the pottery barn analogy thrown about in the wake of the United States' 2003 invasion of Iraq, you break it, you buy it. The history of military interventions in hostile territory bear witness to the fact an invader must balance economic support, industrial production, political vitality, and military initiative regardless of the extent of enemy resistance. In each of these, Russia is increasingly found wanting. More importantly, at the strategic level, the corollary to not losing for Ukraine is to continue doing what it's already doing, raising the temperature of the proverbial pot of water one degree at a time until the Russian frog is boiled. But what do you think? Will Ukraine's tactic be successful, or will Putin once again find a way to wiggle his way out of a sticky situation? Let us know in the comments, and don't forget to subscribe for more military analysis from military experts. Before Russia's invasion of Ukraine, Western observers were wary of its tank force. Russia had the largest tank fleet in the world with 12,556 units. This number was more than its closest rivals North Korea and the United States combined. Meanwhile, Russia's rival Ukraine 
had only about 1,900 tanks before the war began. The numbers looked hopelessly bad for the Ukrainians. However, numbers aren't everything, and the war in Ukraine proved it. In this video, we'll look at how Russia has lost thousands of tanks in its special military operation, how it deceived the world with its number of tanks, and how its tank failures have been systematic in everything from doctrine to design. Russia started the war with disadvantages. Despite its formidable tank fleet on paper, only about 2,600 of Russia's armored units were main battle tanks, defined as a heavily armored tank that is designed to provide direct firepower in head-on combat. For example, the M1 Abrams and its derivatives fit this role for the United States. Other armored vehicles like the M2 Bradley play important parts on the battlefield, but they are not designed to get into direct combat with enemy tanks or heavily fortified positions, so they are not called main battle tanks. To make matters worse for Russia, only about a quarter of its pre-war main battle tanks had modern sighting and fire control systems. These were the T-72B3, B3M, the T-80 BVM, and the T-90AM. Worse still, by November 2022, Colin Carl, the United States Undersecretary for Defense Policy, estimated that Russia had lost half of its pre-war main battle tanks in Ukraine. A year later, the Oryx blog estimates that Russia has lost a total of 2,478 tanks, with 1,621 destroyed, 139 damaged, 170 abandoned, and 548 captured. As a percentage, about 65% of Russia's total tank losses have come through the destruction of its armored units. Ukraine, meanwhile, has lost 689 tanks, with 462 destroyed, 56 damaged, 37 abandoned, and 134 captured. This makes for a Russia to Ukraine casualty ratio of 3.5 to 1. The ratio of tanks lost to destruction between Russia and Ukraine is also 3.5 to 1. However, Ukraine is suffering as well, as 67% of its total tank losses have been through outright destruction rather than damage or abandonment, comparable to the Russian figure. Experts note that Oryx's estimates of the equipment losses on both sides are often a bare minimum and the real losses are likely higher. Even so, the general picture would remain correct. Even though destruction percentages are similar, Russia is losing tanks at a more rapid rate than Ukraine, and many of the tanks that both sides are using have great flaws. Why have so many tanks on both sides been destroyed, compared to being merely damaged or abandoned? Part of the reason is that Russian tanks are prone to catastrophic damage. Unlike Western tanks like the Abrams, Challenger 2 and Leopard 2, Russian tanks do not compartmentalize their ammunition. Instead, some of the tank's shells are stored in the turret. If the tank gets hit, even indirectly, it can start a chain reaction that results in the entire magazine exploding, creating a jack-in-the-box effect so often seen in Ukraine. Some anti-tank weapons, like the American Javelin, are designed to send their projectiles on an arc that impacts the turret of an enemy tank, which has weaker armor than the body. The result is devastating. Russian tanks suffering from jack-in-the-box explosions did not come as a surprise to Western military experts. They had observed the same effect in the Gulf War, when large numbers of Iraqi T-72 tanks were totaled after their turrets got hit by anti-tank weapons. Russia's other supposedly modern tanks, the T-80 and T-90, have the same design flaw. The T-90 entered service in the Russian military in 1992, but its designers did not learn anything from the Gulf War. As of November 2023, the Oryx blog has estimated that, of visually confirmed cases, Russia has lost 1,270 T-72-type tanks across multiple variants. Of these, 815 have been destroyed, a destruction rate of 64%. Meanwhile, Russia has lost 669 T-80 tanks across multiple variants, with 419 of them being destroyed, making for a destruction rate of 62%. Russia has lost 92 of the different types of T-90. Of these, 55 have been destroyed, a rate of about 60%. Russia has also lost 285 other tanks that Oryx could not identify. Of these, 241 were destroyed, making for a staggering 84.5% destruction rate. While Ukraine has gotten much media attention for its newfound use of Western main battle tanks like the Abrams, Challenger and Leopard, most of the units in its armored fleet are still Soviet and Russian-designed tanks. Before the conflict, it had about 900 Soviet-made T-64, T-72, and T-80 tanks. Most of these were of the T-64 class. Of these tanks across multiple variants, 
Ukraine has a total of 376. Of these 376, 241 were destroyed, a rate of 64%. Ukraine has also deployed different tanks of the T-72 class and lost 186 of them, with 132 of them being destroyed, a destruction rate of 71%. 56 Ukrainian T-80s have been lost in combat, 39 of them were destroyed outright, a destruction rate of 69%. In contrast, Ukraine has seen the destruction of just one of the 14 Challenger tanks it's deployed in combat. Meanwhile, of the 25 Leopard tanks that have become casualties in Ukraine, only 9 have seen outright destruction, a rate of 36%. The others were damaged, abandoned, or both. This discrepancy in the destruction rate between Soviet Russian and Western tank designs is because the latter's militaries learned from the experience in Iraq. The Abrams, for example, has its ammunition magazine in a sealed compartment. One of the tank's four crew members retrieves rounds from this compartment, unsealing and resealing the magazine with each shot. This setup means that if the tank is hit, only one of its rounds is likely to be exposed in the turret. This can damage the tank, but the crew is relatively well protected from enemy fire and there is far less of a chance of a chain reaction that produces the jack-in-the-box effect. Russia did seem to finally learn the lesson when it designed its latest tank, the T-14 Armata. Unlike the earlier Soviet-produced designs, the T-14 has an armored protected crew capsule, which is completely separate from the ammunition magazine thanks to the tank's autoloader. Unfortunately for Russia, only about 20 of these units have been produced, far from the 100 that were supposedly in the works with a contract announcement in 2020. Because of international sanctions, logistics, and perennial corruption problems in the Russian military, it's unlikely that Russia will be able to produce many more T-14 tanks anytime soon. Meanwhile, the Armata has never been definitively confirmed as participating in a combat operation in Ukraine. Claims that it has been deployed to the battlefield are likely based on Russian propaganda trying to save face and prevent their country's tank reputation from falling any further. It is likely that the Russian military fears losing the few Armata tanks it's been able to produce. For Russia, the lack of the T-14 Armata also means that it lacks a truly modern main battle tank. Even Russia's supposedly most advanced tank that it can produce in large enough numbers, the T-90, is still based on the T-72, a model which saw its genesis in the late 1960s. Aside from their superior survivability designs, one of the reasons that relatively few of the Western main battle tanks deployed in Ukraine have been destroyed is because their Russian opponents lack the firepower to threaten them. The T-14 Armata was developed with an improved 2A82IM 125mm cannon, which Western military experts conceded was a significant improvement over the guns on the T-72, T-80 and T-90, despite the Armata's other problems. However, this weapon is not backward compatible with Russia's traditional tanks because the breech block does not fit, meaning that the Kremlin cannot deploy it to Ukraine. If the Russians could find a way to field this weapon, the casualty ratio between Ukrainian and Russian tanks might not be so lopsided, but like in many other matters, Russia's poor preparedness for the conflict meant that this problem was overlooked. Additionally, Russia's tank guns have limited mobility. The T-90, for example, can only raise its gun to an arc of 14 degrees or lower it to an arc of 6. In contrast, the Abrams can raise its gun by 20 degrees or lower it by 9. This gives the Abrams greater range than its Russian competitor. The lack of mobility for Russian tank guns also makes them vulnerable in urban combat, contributing to Russian tank losses in Ukraine just as it did in Chechnya. So Russia began the war in Ukraine with a largely outdated series of tanks with design problems that made them prone to catastrophic destruction and ensured that they would lack range and firepower. Because Ukraine started the war with the same kind of outdated tanks, it suffered an armor destruction ratio comparable to its Russian adversary. However, as Ukraine received thousands of modern portable anti-tank weapons like the Javelin, it was able to pile up the damage on Russian tanks in other ways. Russia's staggering losses of its more modern tanks like the T-72, T-80 and T-90 have forced it to dig deeper into its tank fleet and break older models out of storage. The older tanks include the T-64 models that Ukraine has been using, which were designed in the early 1960s. Russia has also used the T-62 tank, the T-64's predecessor which saw its origins in the 1950s, and even in some cases the T-54-55 which had its genesis in the 1940s as a successor to the legendary World War II-era T-34. 
These old tanks have been deployed in Ukraine without any visible upgrades, such as bricks of explosive reactive armor, to better protect them from anti-tank rounds. Perhaps it's for this reason that Russian sources indicate that the T-54-55 tanks in particular have been deployed more as mobile armored artillery vehicles designed for indirect fire assistance. This role seems corroborated by Oryx, as only two T-54-55 type tanks have been reported as visually confirmed casualties, despite their lack of protective armor against modern weapons. One of the tanks was destroyed and the other damaged. Russian sources reported in May 2023 that the T-54-55 has been deployed to Ukraine at the company level. Like other tanks in Ukraine, T-54-55 models have been spotted with cope cages as an ad hoc method to protect against drones and anti-tank missiles. Russia originally wanted the T-62 and its variants in the indirect role that the T-54-55 has been deployed in, but the huge losses of T-72 tanks have forced it to usher in this old tank and the T-64 into frontline direct combat in larger numbers, putting it in the same position as its enemy Ukraine was at the start of the war. According to Oryx, Russia has lost 85 T-62 tanks across its multiple variants, 35 of which have been destroyed, a rate of about 41%. Meanwhile, Russia has lost 78 T-64 tanks, 60 of which have been destroyed, making for a much higher destruction rate of about 77%. The destruction of so many Russian tanks in Ukraine has led to a peculiar phenomenon. As Russia is breaking its Cold War relics out of storage, its Ukrainian enemy is getting a steady supply of Western tanks, which are much more highly survivable and come with more firepower. For example, as damaged Leopard tanks get repaired, more could be coming from Europe in 2024. Germany has pledged that an additional 14 Leopard tanks will be delivered in early 2024 to replace the ones Ukraine has lost. Meanwhile, in November 2023, Germany and Switzerland made a deal to send even more Leopard tanks to Ukraine, adding to the latter's fleet, according to a report by David Axe in Forbes. In the late 1980s, Switzerland bought 380 PZ-87 tanks, which are variants of the Leopard 2A4. While Switzerland upgraded some of these tanks in the 2010s, it put 96 unmodified tanks in storage. Ukraine has long desired these. But Switzerland has centuries of tradition of being a neutral country. Then, on November 22, 2023, the Swiss agreed to export 25 of these tanks to the German Rheinmetall Company, which manufactures automobiles and arms. Technically, the condition the Swiss demanded is that these tanks must remain in NATO or EU territory to meet existing shortfalls. However, there is a loophole that the Swiss gave a wink and a nod to. Rheinmetall is empowered to sell these tanks to a country that already operates Leopard 2A4s, perhaps with German government financing, and that country could then donate to Ukraine its own Leopard 2A4s. So Rheinmetall could sell these tanks to Germany, for example. Germany would then be able to donate them to Ukraine. If these 25 tanks were to arrive in conjunction with the 14 Germany has already pledged, it would make up for the destroyed Leopards and then some, amounting to a new battalion of tanks. As Ukraine's tank force gets steadily more modern, Russia is finding it more and more difficult to replace its best tanks, and as a result, its tank force is getting older and more vulnerable to modern weapons. These older tanks are often not even able to fight at night, unlike the newer Western tanks that are coming into the service of Ukraine. This reality paints a grim picture for Russia as the war continues into its third year. It will need to rely more and more on throwing sheer numbers at the problems facing it. However, Russia's tank problems in Ukraine go far beyond old models and design flaws. While many tanks have been destroyed, many others have been lost due to capture or abandonment. Russian doctrine heavily emphasizes tanks and artillery. In comparison, Western doctrine emphasizes a combined arms approach to warfare. Urban fighting in Iraq helped to flesh this doctrine out. Tanks proved vulnerable without proper infantry support, especially in tighter environments like cities. As a result, Dismounted infantry proved critical to supporting the tanks. Russia, on the other hand, learned nothing from its bitter experiences in the Chechen Wars of the 1990s, where guerrillas armed with anti-tank weapons would wreak havoc on the Russian armor from rooftops, high windows, or when emerging from basements. When Russia deployed its vast tank fleet to Ukraine, it again failed to provide its tanks with proper infantry support, learning nothing from its experiences in Chechnya. 
Long columns of Russian tanks without proper infantry support, often in urban settings, proved vulnerable to the ambushes of Ukrainian anti-tank crews. As we've seen, because of their tanks' design problems, many of Russia's best tank crews became casualties in the earliest phases of the war, when Russia's attacks stalled outside of Kyiv and every other axis except in the southern one that emerged from Crimea. Russian tanks typically come in crews of three – the commander, driver, and gunner. If we take the visually confirmed loss estimates by Oryx and multiply the 1,621 tanks destroyed by three, it would yield a number of 4,863 tank crews becoming casualties in Ukraine. Because Russian tanks tend to blow up in catastrophic destruction thanks to their design flaws, most of these can be assumed to be KIA. These numbers are only rough estimates. They may be higher or lower. Ukrainian sources claimed in the summer of 2023 that Russia has lost over 4,000 tanks in the war. Although because this information is coming from a warring party, it must be treated with skepticism. It is noteworthy, though, that foreign experts have often roughly agreed with Ukraine's figures. For example, Frederick Martins of the Hague Center for Strategic Studies said they were probable in an interview with Newsweek. Regardless, the loss of Russian tank crews has been high because of the thousands of tanks destroyed. Since Russia almost certainly lost thousands of its best-trained tank operators in the early stages of the war, it's had to replace them with poorly trained and motivated new recruits. Much like their mobilized infantry counterparts in places like Bakhmut, Russia's modus operandi has simply been to throw these amateurish crews and outdated tanks into the teeth of the enemy. Russia's problems go further. According to Oryx, at least 176 tanks have been abandoned and a further 548 captured. The real number is probably higher. In contrast, only 37 Ukrainian tanks have been abandoned and 133 captured, ratios of 4.75 to 1 and 4.1 to 1 in favor of Ukraine. Why have the Russians lost so many tanks to abandonment? One of the reasons is that Russia has had problems deploying retrieval vehicles into Ukraine. These vehicles are designed to recover immobilized or damaged armored equipment. The comparative lack of these recovery vehicles in the Russian military is nothing new and date backs to the Soviet era. According to Oryx, Russia has lost a total of 88 armored recovery vehicles. 39 of them have been destroyed and the rest damaged or abandoned. Ukrainian forces have often been seen targeting Russian recovery vehicles with drones. Each loss adds even greater stress to Russia's armed forces. Meanwhile, Ukraine is converting some of its older T-62 tanks into armored recovery vehicles to assist its newer Western tanks. Russian problems go deeper still. Many tanks have needed to be abandoned because of a lack of spare parts or proper mechanics to service them. A comparison with the US military might bring things into perspective. The US Army deploys about 10 support soldiers for every combat soldier to maintain smooth logistics. The Russian army in Ukraine has had far fewer support soldiers, with only about 150 in a typical battalion tactical group being in that category. Each BTG has about 700 to 900 soldiers. Russia, despite being one of the world's leading energy producers, has also suffered fuel shortages in Ukraine. Lack of access to rail hubs that it needs to move equipment and clogged roads have made it hard for Russia to keep its tanks fueled. Ukraine's HIMARS attacks on Russian fuel depots and other important logistical centers have only added greater stress to Russia's tank problems, especially with their constant lack of proper infantry support. In sum, Russia's tank failure in Ukraine is the result of all things coming together. Outdated Soviet-era designs make Russian tanks prone to complete destruction especially against modern anti-tank weapons. Poor doctrine ensures that these tanks often lack adequate infantry support to prevent ambushes, a fact which is shown over and over again at the hands of Ukrainian soldiers armed with portable anti-tank equipment and drones. Finally, poor Russian logistics ensures that tanks often cannot be recovered, repaired, or fueled, which is why so many of them have been abandoned or captured. Russia may have had the world's largest tank force before the war, but it's lost its best tanks at a staggering rate. With events proving that they were not so great, after all, tanks still may be a formidable force on the modern battlefield. But without proper infantry support, they are vulnerable. And without logistical support, they are for all practical purposes immobile. Russia is therefore left with a rapidly aging tank force, which it's throwing en masse into an attritional meat grinder, hoping to bleed Ukraine out so it becomes too exhausted to fight any further the traditional Russian way of war. What else do you think is responsible for Russia's huge tank failures in Ukraine? 
don't forget to let us know in the comments. Also, remember to hit the like button and subscribe for more military analysis from military experts. In Russia in the spring of 2015, flatbed train wagons were spotted carrying unfamiliar armored vehicles. The turrets were carefully wrapped in a tarpaulin, clearly intended to prevent a casual observer from gaining much information about the vehicles. On the 9th of May 2015, at Russia's annual Victory Day Parade, celebrating the defeat of Nazi Germany in May 1945, the tarpaulin came off, and a handful of these vehicles made their first public appearance. It was a brand new tank system, designated the T-14 Armata, or Weapon, main battle tank. It was not an impressive debut. One of the tanks broke down on the parade route and was stranded for 15 minutes until hasty repairs could be made, and it was again able to move off under its own power. But the appearance of the tank caused suppressed ripples of excitement and concern in equal measures amongst Western intelligence communities. What details could be seen suggested a revolutionary new design. The tank commander, braced smartly as he delivered a crisp salute to the watching Russian dignitaries, was not in the turret, but rather in the forward part of the hull. The turret appeared to be uncrewed. The Russian government announced that trials would soon start and then production would begin. There was talk of producing 120 per year and that an ultimate production line of 2,300 tanks would replace and upgrade the entire active Russian tank fleet. A quote family of Armata vehicles was to include an infantry fighting vehicle and armored recovery vehicle and a self-propelled artillery version. This would be a very big deal. But the best part of a decade later, and the T-14 still does not appear to have been produced in any significant numbers. It has not seen any active service and, indeed, its entire future is shrouded in mystery. After the initial fanfare and attention, the T-14s become something of a laughing stock amongst military analysts. In late 2023, many analysts were convinced that the T-14 will never work as a fully produced operational combat vehicle. So what is the T-14? What happened to it and where is it now? And is it any good? Let's take a look at the T-14 Armata. Russian tank design achieved legendary status during the Second World War. You will almost certainly have heard of the T-34, which is still judged to be one of the best tanks of World War II. Its sloped armor, wide tracks, and powerful for the time 76mm gun came as a great shock to the German panzer formations that thrust into Russia during the Operation Barbarossa in June 1941. Other Russian tank designs such as the KV-1, the T-34-85, and the Joseph Stalin sent the Germans scrambling for their tank design drawing boards. During the Cold War, Russian tanks continued to evolve. The T-54-55 series, the T-64 and 72 models, and later the T-80 and T-90. Russian policy was to keep the tanks low to the ground, hard-hitting with a powerful main armament, and available in large numbers. They were rarely as technologically advanced as NATO tanks, but they were largely respected by NATO and Western armies, particularly given the well-understood principle that these tanks would generally be used in massed formations. But it's worth noting that, scratching the surface, the Russian tank industry has always been fractured by rivalries between tank factories, competing designers, corruption, and struggles for attention and resources of the government. Some analysts have looked at the T-64, T-72, and T-80 and concluded that this was an illogical and highly uneconomic production of three versions of what was more or less the same tank. What seems clear is that the Russian military never seems to have managed to settle on one tank type and one family of vehicles. It also looked as if the Russian tank industry was still living off its old glory days without the resources to invest in a new tank suitable for the 2020s and beyond. Perhaps because of these deep-seated historical challenges, Russian tank design has preferred to focus on upgrading existing tank models with new technology, armor, and protective systems, rather than develop a new tank. And the Russians never like to throw any old tanks away. They store them in huge tank parks east of the Ural Mountains for a time when they might be needed. A time such as now. You'll see more or less every Cold War and post-Cold War variety of Russian tank on the battlefields of Ukraine. When a prototype tank design, the T-95, was cancelled in 2010, the Russian tank producing industrial complex of Ural Vagonzavod began working on a new model. It was initially called Object 148. This was to become the T-14 Armada, but it doesn't seem to have been actually based on the previous T-95 work, but rather around a new engine type, the A-85-3, 
a Russian copy of a German model. This engine was used instead of the classic tank engine that had kitted out the T-72s and T-90s. The reason for that is unclear. The A85-3 was smaller but more powerful, but it also turned out to be more complex and less reliable, and it had not even been originally designed for a tank. After the T-14's somewhat embarrassing debut at the 2015 Victory Day Parade, the Western intelligence community started to put their heads together to see what this new development was all about. The information that began to trickle in was, from a Western perspective, very troubling. Given that there is little confirmed or confirmable information about the T-14, we'll have to rely a little heavily on the Russian defense industry brochures and state press statements. This is obviously not ideal, given the high likelihood of propaganda, but let's dive in anyway. So at least we can get a sense of the sort of expectations, hype, and anticipation surrounding this new weapon system. The concept certainly looked highly unique. The turret was to be automated and remote controlled. The three-man crew would sit side by side in a special protected and sealed crew compartment in the front hull of the vehicle. There would even be a toilet provided for the crew, a radical concession to comfort from the tank designers. The tank's main armament was originally intended to have been a 152mm weapon. This was what the earlier T-95 concept was supposed to have mounted but it was later identified as a 125mm gun that would also be able to fire anti-tank missiles. It would have a 57mm grenade launcher and a 12.7mm heavy machine gun automatically operated in the unmanned turret. Average speed on the road was given as 80 km per hour. The seven road wheels either side were connected to an active suspension system that would give a smoother ride and provide more effective fire control while on the move. There was talk that the main gun would be able to shoot down low-flying helicopters. A system of video cameras would be fitted on all sides, and the commander's vision system would be mounted on the turret to allow 360-degree visibility. The crew were supported by a highly responsive combat management computer system that could rapidly analyze the battlefield environment, identify potential threats and targets, and automatically take measures to protect the tank via an Afghanit Active Protection System, or APS. They should be able to detect tank-sized objects at over 7 kilometers in the daytime and half that distance at night. A radar would identify incoming missiles. A new generation of highly secretive Malakit explosive reactive armor had also been promised. This would surround the tank with advanced protective layers of composite armor that exploded when struck, deflecting any oncoming missile. The APS deployed hard-kill defensive measures, such as systems that could attack incoming missiles and even actual tank rounds and soft-kill processes that could disrupt, confuse, and deflect any incoming attack. Some analysts concluded that the Russian designers had based the tank's defensive measures on the highly effective modern Israeli tank, the Merkava. The manufacturer claimed that special radar-absorbing paint would render the T-14 more or less invisible. A T-15 infantry fighting vehicle variant was also spotted at the Victory Day Parade, and a photograph of a T-16 tank recovery version Equipped with a bulldozer blade and an automated 12.7mm machine gun turret was issued by the manufacturers. Both variants seem to have the same armor defensive measures as the T-14. Western intelligence analysts were quick to express concern about the potential of this new vehicle system. The unmanned turret design would afford the vehicle a lighter, faster, lower profile. A leaked United Kingdom Ministry of Defense document showed very real worry about the capabilities of the T-14. In November 2016, the British Daily Telegraph newspaper carried some dramatic quotes from the assessment, calling it a groundbreaking tank and the most revolutionary step change in tank design in the last half century. A stark question was posed, are we on the cusp of a new technological arms race? There was also grave concern that the West was not also developing any plans for a tank to rival the T-14. At the time, the British and Americans were focused on the challenges of counterinsurgency warfare in the mountains, waterways, and deserts of Afghanistan. The defense industry design and development effort was being directed toward high-mobility vehicles and the challenges of defeating improvised explosive devices. For the last 20 years, Britain had no significant need for a new fleet of main battle tanks. The 2016 Military Balance Report from the International Institute for Strategic Studies similarly described the T-14 as, quote, revolutionary highlighting the tank's active protection systems as something that would greatly reduce the risk from rocket-propelled grenades and anti-tank guided missiles. After the initial announcements and revelations of the new T-14 concept, there was an analytical backlash 
In the absence of any verifiable evidence, Western analysts gradually adopted a more skeptical view of the T-14. U.S. analysis in 2015 was already pointing out that there had been no independent verification or public demonstrations of the claims and capabilities attributed to the T-14, particularly how effective the defense systems would be. The American National Interest Journal in late 2016 observed that U.S. analysts felt that the capability claims of the T-14 were greatly exaggerated. The practicalities of producing a new high-tech tank were pointed out, starting with the fact that Russia simply did not have the money and resources to produce the tank in any significant numbers. Well, the claims for the T-14 were certainly impressive. However, a famous British football manager once dryly observed, We had a great team on paper. Unfortunately, the match was played on grass. So now, having heard the hype, let's step back a bit and review some of the practical problems that the T-14 might have, as its manufacturers attempt to move it from a theoretical drawing concept to an actual working battlefield-dominating weapon. The production schedule and cryptic messages from the Russian government and industry pointed to some of these problems. The Russian Ministry of Defense declared in 2016 that a batch of 100 T-14 tanks would be manufactured by 2020 as part of a project that would go on until 2025. But this served to set the scene for confused announcements, contradictions, and delays to this original timeframe. In 2018, the Deputy Prime Minister for the Defense and Space Industry reportedly said that there was actually no need for a new main battle tank system as the Russian army had more than enough of the older tanks, the various modified variants of the T-72 in particular, to suffice. This argument held that the existing vehicles were still effective as tank platforms and they would be cheaper and more practical to simply continue on with them, upgrading them with offensive and defensive measures as appropriate. This was probably a better and more realistic reflection of the harsh realities facing the Russian arms industry, but it also gave some indication of the doubts already surrounding the long-term prospects for the T-14. Finances were strained and access to high-tech computer technology was hard, given the sanctions imposed on Russia after the invasion of Ukraine in 2014. But it went in the direct contradiction of the defense industry and other parts of the government. The month after this statement came out, it was reported that a contract had been signed for 32 T-14 tanks and 100 T-15 infantry fighting vehicles. By early February 2019, the first dozen tanks were supposed to have been built, but nothing had happened and a subsequent announcement in August said that 16 would not be delivered until the end of the year. In November, the deadline had slipped further into early 2020. When 2020 rolled around, there was absolutely no evidence that anything like 100 tanks had been produced even though there was still talk of state trials taking place and even bolder talk about unmanned versions of the T-14. But in January, the head of Rostec, Russia's largest state-owned arms company, stated that no T-14s had yet been produced and that the engine design had not yet been finalized. In August 2020, it was announced that production had started and that the tank would be given to the armed forces in 2021. But as the years drifted by, these announcements were looking less and less convincing. Another statement in July 2021 said that production would begin in 2022. However, the Russian Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu had already slightly undermined this in March, when he said the first group to be produced would only be for experimental purposes. The gap between reality and actuality continued to stretch, with announcements in December 2021 that the ammunition loader for the main armament was being trialed in 2022, and that full serial production would take place and that 40 T-14s would be delivered after 2023. In the summer of 2022, the Russian army was several months into its invasion of Ukraine. The invasion was not going well. The war in Ukraine exposed many vulnerabilities of the Russian tank fleet. YouTube was awash with dozens of spectacular examples of tanks erupting in brilliant orange balls of flame with the turrets hurtling skyward. This showed, amongst other things, that the automatic loading concept for the main armament were flawed. Shells were not being adequately protected inside the turret, with disastrous consequences. The tank designers scrambled to identify what lessons the current conflict might reveal for the T-14. The defensive measures attributed to the T-14 seem designed to protect all sides, but not from above, which is becoming a favorite angle of attack for drones. Based on early experiences of Russian armor in Ukraine, ideas for modifications for the T-14 were drafted to extend the range of the active protection system to offer more protection against rocket-propelled grenades and anti-tank guided missiles 
and to add better defense against electromagnetic and microwave weapons. In addition, it became clear that minefields were still popular with both sides, requiring new ways of remotely dealing with this threat. This would point to more delays to production. A weapon system that can prove itself effective and reliable on the battlefield can make it a highly attractive sales option for other countries. The Russians have claimed that both the Indians and the Chinese had expressed interest, and perhaps Egypt and Belarus. But it's one thing to be interested, quite another to step up with a multi-million ruble contract. Norinco, China's state-owned defense corporation, has claimed that their own tank, the VT-4, is superior to the T-14. So, here's the big question. Given that the T-14 has been evident at victory parades since 2015, is there any evidence that it's been tested in combat operations? Nearly a decade on. Well, as of today, there's no credible evidence that the T-14 has any real combat experience to point to. Curiously, in 2020, Russian government sources floated the idea that the T-14 had been tested in Syria. This seems highly unlikely even if we remembered that, quote, tested, doesn't necessarily mean, quote, combat tested. But the big question mark now is whether the T-14 has seen any service in Ukraine. For propaganda purposes and perhaps even more importantly, achieving the full overseas sales potential, it would be ideal for the Russian army to be able to point to T-14 tanks advancing across the Ukraine steppe, engaging in defeating the Western tanks, such as the German Leopard 2 and the American Abrams, with which the Ukrainian army is being equipped. A photograph of a T-14 posing next to the shattered hull of a decadent Western main battle tank would be the icing on the cake for President Putin. But so far, we've seen very little credible evidence of any T-14s in Ukraine in a serious combat role. Is it reasonable to expect that social media networks, open source intelligence, and drones would surely have picked up pictures of the T-14 in action by now? The Ukrainians would have reported engaging something as distinctive and interesting as a T-14. Surely. In December 2022, Russian television showed clips of the T-14 undergoing what was described as combat training and with the commentary that the tank had already been deployed to the combat zone. The size and nature of the combat zone was never clear, nor even if the tank was actually in Ukraine at all. The state-owned Russian press agency Novosti reported in late April 2023 that the T-14 had been used in an indirect fire roll against Ukrainian positions. This implies the tank had been lined up behind a hill, forest, or built-up area, out of sight of the enemy and used as a form of artillery. This is not exactly the type of tactic envisaged for a frontline main battle tank. If this reporting is accurate, it suggests the Russians feel their T-14 is not yet ready for a full test in combat. Or they're worried it might break down and get captured. Or they're simply trying to score a propaganda victory. Or all of the above. On the 9th of May 2023, no T-14 tanks appeared at the World War II victory parade. In July 2023, the Russian state-owned news agency TASS briefly noted that the T-14 was being used by Russian forces in southern Ukraine to test and assess the tank's performance. In any case, by the end of August 2023, the Ukrainians had never reported meeting it in battle, and on September 4th, the Russian press reported that the T-14 had been withdrawn from Ukraine. Perhaps the manufacturers simply wanted an as-used-in-Ukraine tag and a photo opportunity for the marketing brochure. But interestingly, the report also stated that additional side armor protection had been added to the tank to guard against anti-tank strikes. Clearly, the conflict in Ukraine has been throwing up fundamental development challenges, not least from drones, anti-tank missiles, and long-range artillery for all tanks in armored warfare. And let's just pause a moment. There are many other factors that impact a tank's effectiveness on the battlefield beyond merely the size of the gun and the thickness of the armor. Morale, motivation, and training are crucial. Tactical doctrine decides how best a tank should be used. Cooperation with artillery, infantry, and air power is also vital. Having a three-man crew does offer much spare capacity for routine maintenance, cooking food, mounting sentry duty, and a host of other routine but tiring tasks in a combat zone. The Russian logistics system is in tatters reliant on men to lug ammunition around rather than automated loading systems with pallets and machines to take the strain. You could have the best tank in the world on paper, but still see it abandoned because the crew is unwilling to move into the assault or the tank has shed a track or because they simply have run out of fuel. But still, the myths and hype persisted. In some elements of the Russian media, there was still seemingly misplaced confidence that the T-14 would be a world-beater. An August 2022 article breathlessly reported that by 2030, the T-14 would be so advanced 
that the crew would be operating their own reconnaissance drones, deploy a 152mm gun, a caliber which, let's not forget, is normally the stuff of heavy artillery, fire thermobaric fuel air explosives and supersonic rounds, shoot fire and forget missiles, and be able to identify enemy targets at ranges of over 6 kilometers. When large-scale Russian land, sea, and air forces plunged into Ukraine in 2022, suddenly the world was witnessing a large-scale conflict that involved major tank actions. The Russian army suffered and continues to suffer extremely high losses to its tank, artillery, airborne, and infantry forces. Numbers of casualties of men and equipment losses remain hard to pin down, but there is a lot of credible reporting to suggest that Russia has lost a quarter of a million men and between three to 5,000 armored vehicles. Many analysts were shocked by the scale of Russia tank losses and the ease with which they catastrophically exploded when struck. Some analysts went as far as to predict that the tank was now an obsolete weapon of war and that drones and missiles would now rule the battlefield. This analysis is probably premature, but the rapid evolution of anti-tank technology in Ukraine is causing much pause for thought in terms of tank design. It's likely that Russian tank designers, just like their Western counterparts, will be taking a wholesale head-scratching review of just what it means to be a tank on the battlefields of the 2030s and 2040s. But Russia, still embedded deep in this brutal conflict inside Ukraine, desperately needs tanks now, and not 10 years in the future. They've reportedly lost between 1,500 and 2,000 tanks in battle. They have no significant manufacturing capability to crank out the current tank types, let alone build, test, and mass-produce serious numbers of a brand new, unproven, and technologically complex piece of equipment. Each of the T-14 tanks to date have been lovingly handmade. There's no factory production line standing by, ready to roll out fresh, new, modern armor in the way that the Stalingrad tank works in 1942, we're able to churn out T-34 tanks and drive them directly to the front line. And sanctions are greatly impeding the ability of defense manufacturers to access the high-quality, complex electronics that are primarily available in the West. In one crazy example from October 2022, the Swedish press began reporting the mysterious disappearance of traffic speed cameras all over the country. Crucial parts of the cameras were then smuggled into Russia, where the electronic parts could be cannibalized for Russian drones. We shouldn't write off the T-14 entirely just yet. The apparent failure – failure is probably the best word here – of the T-14 development and procurement process could be used as a lesson for the Russian designers. Perhaps the T-14 or aspects of its design might end up as a technology demonstrator for new ideas further downstream, but the current realities make it highly unlikely that the Russian tank industry, suffering from corruption, lack of resources and limited finances, will be able to conceive, design and mass produce a new tank system anytime soon. They'll probably have to stick with updates to older models the T-72 and T-90 types. The T-90M is probably the most modern Russian tank on the battlefield at present. These upgrades are expensive and difficult enough, and the rapidly changing battlefield environment will make this even more complicated. And who knows, perhaps in 10 years or so, in 2034, a new Russian tank system successor to the T-14 will find itself acquiring the legendary designator of T-34. While it's certainly possible, but think of it this way, with all the long-term flaws in the Russian government and procurement system, corruption, lack of funds, lack of assembly lines, technology sanctions, and so on, perhaps this new T-34 might turn out to be a real turkey. Oh, but you're welcome to buy the T-14 yourself at 1 35th scale, paints and brushes included. At least the plastic production lines seem to be working. But what do you think? In what way is the T-14 radical or ridiculous? Let us know in the comments. And don't forget to subscribe for more military analysis from military experts. First tanks, and now submarines. Putin can't seem to keep hold of his weapons, with Russia's only aircraft carrier catching fire not once, not twice, but three times since 2018, and his guided missile cruiser the Moskva sinking in 2022, Russia's navy, widely considered one of the most powerful in the world, has seen better days. And now, Russia's submarine power is under serious threat. Here's why. It's no secret that things haven't been going well for Russia. From crushing sanctions to staggering military casualties, Putin's invasion of Ukraine has backfired in a host of unexpected ways. It has also highlighted profound weaknesses in Russia's military capabilities, exposing them as aging, corrupt, and poorly led. 
Nowhere is this more true than at sea. Despite statements by former Russian President Dmitry Medvedev back in 2009 that, without a navy, Russia does not have a future as a state, the country's surface fleet remains embarrassingly inept. Former US Navy Admiral James G. Foggo recently noted that it has been allowed to atrophy due to factors like poor maintenance, low funding, and corruption. This trend has been on full display during recent years, with the Russian Navy suffering a number of embarrassing high-profile mishaps. Its only aircraft carrier, the Admiral Kuznetsov, nicknamed the unluckiest ship in the world, has caught fire at least three times since 2018. Earlier this year, Ukrainian intelligence assessed that the ship is in critical condition and not capable of moving under its own power. That's not to mention the sinking of Russia's Black Sea flagship, the Moskva, in April 2022. But now there's an even bigger problem for Putin, one deep below the waves. For all the issues with its surface fleet, Russia's current fleet of 58 submarines have been long considered among the most powerful in the world. This includes 11 nuclear-powered ballistic missile subs, 17 nuclear-powered attack subs, and 9 nuclear-powered cruise missile subs, with several more on the way next year. While they haven't been a factor in Ukraine, they are still considered a critical threat by the US military. However, their power may not last forever. Recent reports suggest that Russia's submarine capabilities are being seriously harmed by the backlash to its invasion, especially through the crippling effect of Western sanctions. So what does that mean for the future of the Russian military? And just how serious of a blow could it be to Putin's war machine? To understand just how critical Putin's submarine problem could be, we first need to take a quick look at some Russian naval history, which, funnily enough, is permeated with continuing and humiliating losses of fleets. But wait, there's a plot twist, and it occurs just after World War II. Russia has had military power at sea in one form or another since 1696, when Peter the Great first established the Imperial Russian Navy. Impressed by his visits to Western Europe, Peter realized that Russia could never be a true great power while remaining landlocked. By 1710, he had over 58 ships in his fleet, and despite some defeats, by Peter's death in 1725, Russia was the dominant sea power in the Baltic. During the reign of Catherine the Great, the empire's ambitions at sea had grown, establishing a new Black Sea fleet and annexing Crimea for the first time in 1783. By the time of her death in 1796, Russia possessed the world's largest navy after Britain. This period was the height of Russia's imperial naval power. As naval historian Robert A. Theobald once put it, to my mind, the death of Catherine marks the high watermark in Russian naval history. From this date to the end of the imperial navy, it was on a treadmill working hard, but getting nowhere. This became obvious during the Crimean War of 1853 to 1856, where Russia suffered a stinging defeat to the combined forces of the Ottomans, France, and Britain. The shortcomings of the Imperial Navy were even more obvious by the time of the 1904-1905 Russo-Japanese War. But it gets worse. In response to Russian expansionism in the Far East, the newly industrialized Japanese military gave Russian Tsar Nicholas II a humiliating defeat at sea. The war marked Japan's emergence as a great power and contributed heavily to the First Russian Revolution of 1905. Following the Second Revolution in 1917, what remained of the old Imperial Navy came under control of the Soviet Union. And while Lenin and Stalin both aimed to rebuild a powerful Soviet Navy, it remained largely inept throughout both world wars and into the early 1950s. As Theobald described it in his well-known 1953 presentation at the US Naval War College, this is the history of a navy which has lost more complete fleets than any other navy in the world. It is the history of a navy which has never been more than second-rate that has never been decisive in world history and that has never developed a depth of tradition to compare with those of the Western navies. But this would change drastically only a few years after his assessment, mainly due to one factor, modern submarines. While Russia had some early submarines before World War II, the first modern Soviet ballistic missile submarines were completed in the late 1950s. These early Soviet models were diesel electric and based on designs pioneered by the Germans similar to the United States. However, by 1960, the Soviet Navy had launched its first nuclear-powered attack submarines, giving the USSR below-surface capabilities greater than perhaps any country except the US. Soon after, the Soviets also developed nuclear SSGN-class subs, running on nuclear power 
but designed to launch limited ballistic missile strikes against American aircraft carriers and other naval deployments. Over the next three decades, the Soviet Navy continued to build and maintain a large fleet of submarines, relying on them heavily to challenge America's greater military strength during the Cold War. Because the true names of Soviet subs were rarely known abroad, most are still referred to by NATO codenames, such as the Alpha-class nuclear subs. These use liquid metal-cooled reactor propulsion systems and titanium hulls, enabling them to move extremely fast, over 43 knots, or 80 kilometers an hour, at an operational depth of 2,000 feet, or 600 meters. Also important to Soviet deterrence and power projection were the Typhoon-class subs. The largest submarines ever built, Typhoons are over 563 feet, or 172 meters long, have a beam of 81 feet, or 25 meters, and can carry up to 20 Sturgeon nuclear-capable ballistic missiles. These were just a few of the many varieties of subs developed by the Soviet Navy. And the Soviets also continued heavily building diesel-electric models as well, such as the Kilo-class attack subs and others. The fleet was never able to make the switch to fully nuclear-powered, largely due to budgetary and technological constraints. However, by its peak in 1980, the USSR's submarine force had 480 boats, including 71 fast attack and 94 cruise and ballistic missile submarines. Even following the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991, this submarine fleet remained a major part of Russia's naval power. Dmitry Gorenberg of the Center for Naval Analyses has noted that during the post-Cold War period, Putin has focused on developing new submarine capabilities, while Russia has essentially lost the ability to construct new, advanced surface vessels. The most advanced of these submarine developments are the Yasin and updated Yasin M-class SSGNs. Developed in the 1990s and early 2000s, Rand Corporation researcher Edward Geist has described these as the crown jewel of the contemporary Russian Navy, and perhaps the pinnacle of present-day Russian military technology. And according to Admiral Fogo, one major advantage of the Yasin-class vessels is that they are very quiet, which is the most important thing in submarine warfare. They can also carry both Sirkon hypersonic and long-range caliber cruise missiles. Yet these deadly subs also come with a hefty price tag. The Severa Davinsk, the first Yasin-class model, reportedly cost over $1.6 billion. While this is still much cheaper than the US's most advanced subs, it is a very high price tag considering Russia's far smaller economy. In the past few years, Putin's government has also claimed that even more nuclear subs are in the works, including what Russian state media claim to be a new division of submarines carrying nuclear-capable super torpedoes in the coming years. Nick Childs, senior fellow for naval forces and maritime security at the International Institute for Strategic Studies, has argued that investments in submarines up to this point are one of the only things which has allowed Russia to maintain its status among the leading powers. While its fleet is still far smaller than during the Soviet era, Childs points out that it remains very capable and along with some of the older submarines would still pose a threat to NATO, both at sea and against land-based targets. But even before the war in Ukraine, there were some doubts about the true effectiveness of Russia's impressive-seeming subs. While they are doubtless in better shape than its surface fleet, they have never been truly tested in combat. So how are Putin's submarine fleets faring in the Russo-Ukraine conflict? On land, the reckless nature of Russian military doctrine has been on full display in the invasion of Ukraine. But despite the enormous losses by Russia's ground forces, its navy has so far played a very limited role in the conflict. This includes its submarines, which have remained mostly as a nuclear deterrent and threat. The exception to this is Russia's Black Sea Fleet, where submarines off the coast of Sevastopol and Novorossiysk have been used to fire caliber missiles into Ukraine. None of these subs have so far been damaged or destroyed, and there are still concerns that they could be used to counter NATO activity and control trade routes in the Black Sea. But the consequences of Putin's invasion have created a different kind of problem for the Russian Navy and its submarines. The crushing regime of Western sanctions imposed on Russia has begun to erode the country's ability to resupply and maintain its military industry. And in December of 2022, the US State Department added even more sanctions directly targeting Russia's naval power. These have already begun to work, cutting Russia off from the technology required in modern subs. As Admiral Fogo told Newsweek in an interview, 
I think they have been severely crippled by these economic sanctions and by their own foolishness in the war in Ukraine. In particular, the maintenance of existing subs and development of new ones will become increasingly difficult since, when they don't have the raw materials, they can't sustain the industrial base. They don't have the manpower because that manpower is going into fighting the war in Ukraine. Military losses and brain drain make it likely that Russia will lose its ability to compete with Western countries in submarine development, especially when it comes to their ability to project power. Graham P. Hurd of the George C. Marshall European Center for Security Studies argues that the protracted nature of the conflict and the coming Ukrainian counter-offensive undercuts Russian military credibility. The repeated military failures in Ukraine have created growing pressure in Russia to project an image of strength through its submarines. In turn, this has incentivized the Russian Navy to take greater risks by using submarines which are not seaworthy and fast-tracking new weapon systems without proper testing. Heard added that submarines are the most expensive ticket item in Russia's military budget and have no obvious utility in this war so Russia compensates and projects power through acceptance of greater risk. As a consequence, Russia's submarines will suffer indirect and long-term damage the longer the war lasts. Similarly, Heard and other experts have pointed out that the sanctions illustrate just how much of Russia's military-industrial complex was, and remains, reliant on critical Western technology. Without the advanced components for submarines manufactured in the US, UK, France, Germany and elsewhere, Russian development will be seriously stunted in the years to come, and there are almost no alternatives to the technology which sanctions have cut Russia off from. Parts from China and Iran, for example, are not advanced enough to meet Moscow's requirements. While experts remain divided on just how dependent Russia's nuclear submarines are on Western tech, it's pretty clear that at least some of the imported components are necessary to build new vessels. These are mostly thought to be technologically advanced electronic components for guidance, communication and missile deployment. Russian defense journalist Alexander Timokhin wrote in January that the sanctions imposed on Russia after the special military operation left a sharp imprint on the country's technological capabilities. The production of radar complexes, communication systems, guided missiles, sonar equipment and other similar systems has proved to be difficult. As a consequence, these restrictions could make it nearly impossible to build Yasin and Yasin M-class subs and other highly capable boats. Childs from the International Institute for Strategic Studies points out that this trajectory is already visible, as while the newest Russian submarines are very capable, Russia's inefficient shipbuilding industry has struggled to deliver them on time and in significant numbers. Like other experts, he agrees that Russia's construction shortfalls will accelerate in the coming months and years since this could well be exacerbated by the increased demands on other sectors of the defense industry as a result of the war, as well as from the impact of sanctions on certain key components. So what do these deficiencies mean for Putin's ambitions and the future of the Russian military? Well, experts have outlined two main possible scenarios for the future of Russia's submarine fleet. One possibility is that as military resource constraints continue to grow, it will lead to prioritization of the elements which have been most impacted, especially ground forces. As of May 2023, Russia has lost nearly 200,000 soldiers, a truly staggering figure for a modern military. In turn, as one analyst put it, that will inevitably lead to cuts, or limits at least, in shipbuilding in the future. The other possibility is that Russia will be forced to funnel more investment into submarines due to their relative importance and strategic value. This will mean less and less resources for replenishing ground troops and equipment, which are both cheaper and more expendable. But even if Putin opts for the second scenario, any money spent now is likely to have a delayed impact. Past investments in submarine development and maintenance will carry the Russian fleet for at least a few more years to come, but within five to ten years, it could be a very different picture. Just based on the size and current capabilities of Russian submarines, it will likely remain one of the world's most powerful fleets for the next decade. But after that, things are far more uncertain. Any modern submarine which breaks down in the years could become essentially useless, reduced to just so much expensive scrap metal. However Putin attempts to manage his growing economic constraints, the main role of Russian submarines will probably remain as a nuclear deterrent. And there are also some indications that Putin has already realized 
just how spread thin his resources really are. In March, Russia's Pacific Fleet underwent a series of military drills which were described as a surprise inspection of more than a dozen submarines, potentially signaling a lack of faith by the Kremlin in the readiness or maintenance of the fleet. Readouts from the Kremlin show that Putin recently told Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu that while Russia's priorities remain the war in Ukraine, still, the objective to develop the Navy, including in the Pacific Theater of Operations, remains relevant. Adding that, it is clear that some of the fleet's assets can be used in conflicts elsewhere. This indicates both that Putin does not believe submarines can make much of a difference in Ukraine, and that they remain most useful as a nuclear deterrent. As Russia's submarines begin to break down in the coming years, with no easy way to maintain them or build new state-of-the-art models, the country will also become less able to project power in this way. This will almost certainly happen, regardless of where the Kremlin prioritizes resources, especially since casualties in Ukraine show no sign of slowing down. As losses climb higher and higher, and as sanctions continue their squeeze, it may also provoke Putin into even more aggressive and reckless strategies. In fact, there is evidence that this is already taking place. In the past few months, Russia has deployed submarines in increasingly threatening positions. As Michael Peterson, the director of the Russia Maritime Studies Institute, told Newsweek, we have indications that nuclear-powered submarines have been deploying off the coast of the United States and into the Mediterranean and elsewhere along Europe periphery, in ways that mirror Soviet-style submarine deployments in the Cold War. Such aggressive posturing is likely tied to Putin's growing issues in an attempt to project a facade of Russia as a true global power, despite an economy less than half the size of California. This weakness is also reflected in overly optimistic predictions for its military-industrial complex. A recent analysis by the Institute for the Study of War ISW, concluded, similarly to other experts, that Russian officials continue to claim that Russian defense manufacturers are increasing production amidst ongoing indications that the Russian Defense Industrial Base DIB, is unable to meet Russia's long-term economic and military goals. There have been rosy claims by officials like Alexei Rachmanov, head of the Russian United Shipbuilding Company, that submarine production time will soon be cut by 8 to 13 months. But there is little evidence to support this. And in another sign of growing weakness, Putin signed a decree on February the 27th, reducing previous plans to construct at least three nuclear reactor-equipped LIDAR-class icebreakers by 2035 down to just a single vessel. Again, this likely reflects the fact that the need to replenish the stocks of conventional ground weaponry lost in Ukraine will likely consume the majority of Russia's DIB and limit Russia's ability to produce systems aimed at longer-term strategic goals. This includes both nuclear icebreakers and submarines, indicating that Russia's resources are spread much thinner than Putin would like the world to believe. So, to sum up, despite the claims by the Kremlin, there are strong signs that Russia's disastrous strategy in Ukraine has backfired even more than we know. The squeeze of Western sanctions now threatens to render even the deadly Russian submarine fleet obsolete. The longer the war goes on and the more isolated Russia becomes, the harder it will be to obtain the advanced components needed for these vessels. This will continue to erode the country's industrial base, possibly crippling all long-term defense production. And because Russian losses in Ukraine are so heavy, Putin also faces a crisis of credibility and growing pressure to project a facade of power. This has already led to reckless, aggressive posturing by Russian subs and a willingness to use vessels which are not even seaworthy, a problem which seems likely to increase because the Russian Navy has historically been so reliant on them to project power, there is little question that the stagnation of its submarine fleet will be a serious blow in the coming years. But what do you think? Will sanctions and battlefield losses eventually doom Russia's submarine fleet? Or can Putin find a way around these issues and keep Russia as a great power? Let us know what you think in the comments section below. And don't forget to subscribe for more military content and analysis. Putin is terrified of F-16s in Ukraine, and he should be. Since basically the beginning of the Russian invasion, Ukraine has been pleading with its Western supporters for advanced fighter jets. For most of the war, the US has been staunchly opposed to giving Ukraine these systems, as they could allow for strikes far behind Russian lines, escalating the conflict. But now, officials in Kyiv might be finally getting their wish, in the form of US-made F-16s set to be delivered later this year. 
As of this video, the training for Ukrainian F-16 pilots has begun in Denmark and is set to begin in multiple other NATO countries such as the Netherlands. Back at the annual G7 summit in May, with Ukraine's Zelensky as a special guest, US President Joe Biden announced that the US would conduct its own training for Ukrainian F-16 pilots, which it estimated could be completed in under a year, with basic training possibly taking only four months. But where might all these jets be coming from? How important are they to Ukraine? And perhaps most importantly, how could they change the outcome of this brutal and unpredictable war? Let's start with the question of where exactly the F-16s might be coming from. There are more than 2,200 F-16s around the world, making it the most popular combat aircraft in use today. But the most likely candidates seem to be jets recently retired by the Netherlands, Denmark and Norway. These would likely be the F-16 AMBM models, which were originally acquired in the 1980s and upgraded in the 1990s. All of these would therefore be aging aircraft with high mileage and old radar systems. But even with these drawbacks, the jet software allows them to use some of the most modern and deadly weapons in the NATO arsenal, including the AIM-120 air-to-air missiles and stealthy long-range joint air-to-surface standoff missiles, or JASMs. Reports suggest that the Netherlands in particular was closely involved in the effort to get Washington to approve the F-16 training, helping convince Biden of their need in Ukraine. Interestingly, however, the F-16s aren't coming from the US at all. This is probably partially due to the tensions with China, for which the Pentagon is keeping significant material in reserve in case an air or naval battle breaks out over the Taiwan Strait or South China Sea. The other main reason is that US policymakers still worry that too aggressive or successful a strike by Ukraine could force Putin's hand in ways we'd all rather not think about. That was the rationale behind the strategy so far. Give Ukraine as many surface-to-air and land capabilities as possible while avoiding the potential of an aerial strike inside Russian territory. But this logic has already been challenged by Ukraine's use of drones in so-called shaping operations in recent weeks some of which have reached as far as Moscow. Because of this, the authorization for Ukraine to receive F-16s and the associated training has been a matter of tension in Washington for months. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin and several others have objected to the idea, essentially claiming that there were too many unknowns and that Ukraine has done well enough without F-16s. So the approval for other countries to ship their F-16s to Ukraine is still a big change, overriding a key condition baked into their initial sale by the US, which prohibited European allies from sending them elsewhere. Secretary of State Antony Blinken was apparently one of the driving forces behind the administration's decision, as well as helping to convince European NATO allies to get on board. Yet even so, it's unclear when any of these countries will actually be supplying the F-16s in question. The Netherlands, Belgium and Denmark are working towards replacing their current F-16s with more advanced F-35s, but have all held back on actually committing to sending the old jets to Ukraine. Similarly, the UK has offered to provide flight training, but doesn't actually operate any F-16s itself. While this may start to change once the training is complete, there's currently a lot of hesitation from the West about pushing Putin just a little too far and ending up in some sort of nuclear standoff. Some countries like Belgium also worry about diminishing their own capabilities. Not that Belgium is a likely candidate to be invaded by anyone, Others, like Denmark, have stated that they will reconsider sending F-16s if others are also doing so, but that they won't go it alone. The Netherlands and Norway appear to be similarly torn, while other countries with F-16s not in the process of being phased out are much less likely to join in. In a nutshell, at the moment it's pretty clear that even those countries which have declared support for Ukraine's push for jets either can't or aren't willing to provide significant numbers of them in the short to medium term. Once Ukraine actually gets the aircraft, there's another set of problems it needs to deal with. Specifically, they must be able to operate, maintain, and sustain the F-16s, which is not the easiest task. For instance, a March 2023 study by the Congressional Research Service identified several crucial conditions necessary to successfully field the jets. The biggest concerns it identified concern the supply chain. This means acquiring sufficient spare parts, allocating funding for operations and support, implementing a maintenance inventory system, training maintainers, and acquiring an ongoing supply of weapons with which to arm their F-16s. These tasks are difficult enough for countries in peacetime, with previous experience and a wide base of technical knowledge. For Ukraine, they are likely to be even trickier, 
Of course, if the course of the war so far is anything to judge by, Ukrainians will continue to figure out inventive solutions to logistical issues facing their military. Russians, on the other hand, have no hope of obtaining advanced fighter jets and are stuck using obsolete human wave tactics while trying to avoid kicking off a civil war in their own country. But even accounting for the staggering incompetence of the Russian military, Ukraine certainly still faces some hurdles obtaining and operating even used F-16s. If they take to the skies without plans to support these aircraft, they will break down quickly and most likely become expensive stationary targets for Russian air-to-surface missiles. This is especially true for the F-16, which can require some 18 hours of maintenance for every hour of flight time. Basically, if they do things right and don't rush it, there's a strong possibility that Ukraine won't even be using the F-16s until the end of 2023. This also suggests that many defense experts believe the war will continue for quite some time, despite the incompetence of the Russian armed forces and short mutiny of the Wagner Group PMC. By greenlighting the transfer of the F-16s, the US is essentially admitting that the war will not stop anytime soon, and that Ukraine will need continual upgrades to its firepower in a long-term war of attrition. If Ukraine can get a handle on the jet's supply and maintenance, that's when the training will really start to become important. Like any complex weapon system, the F-16 was designed to fill a particular set of roles in an existing military structure and support certain doctrines of modern warfare. To get the most out of them, the Ukrainians will need to adopt more of the practices and techniques which the plane's design caters to. Fundamentally, the F-16 was designed to help the US Air Force beat the Russian Air Force in aerial combat. Logic follows that the more the Ukrainians can fly them like the US Air Force would, the better the results will be. Of course, other NATO countries have adopted similar practices, but most of these are also quite different from the ways Ukraine has been fielding their existing fighter jets. For one thing, the F-16 was essentially designed to be a lightweight, multi-role fighter capable of doing many different missions well, but not to be the best at any of them. F-16s were definitely not intended to be operated from improvised airfields as Ukraine has been doing with many of its current aircraft. They can be especially susceptible to getting debris caught in their engines, a great way to crash before ever engaging in combat. This brings up the issue of where Ukraine would put the 200 F-16s it's asking for. RAND Corporation analysts John Hone and William Courtney recently assessed that F-16s do best on long, pristine runways. They could face difficulties on the rougher, former Soviet ones dispersed across Ukraine. To bring in Western aircraft, Ukraine might need to repave and potentially extend a number of runways, a process which Russia would likely detect. If only a few airfields were suitable and in known locations, focused Russian attacks could impede Ukrainian F-16s from flying. This is mostly because idiotic and unprepared as most of Russia's military might be, they still have access to some pretty advanced technology. This is especially true when it comes to air-to-air -to -air combat. Modern Russian air fighters such as the MiG-31 and Su-35 can see quite far with their powerful modern radars. They also have R-37 missiles that have a longer range than NATO-supplied AIM-120 AMRAMs or advanced medium-range air-to-air missiles. In other words, Russian aircraft can potentially spot Ukrainian F-16s and shoot them down before the Ukrainian pilots see them coming. Some of this has already happened with Ukraine's current fleet of Su-27 and MiG-29 fighters, and the improved capabilities of the F-16 are not enough to change this dynamic. Because of the reach of these Russian fighters, Ukrainian fighter pilots often break off missions early or operate far behind their own front lines. F-16s would operate with the same constraints, limiting their ability to perform air-to-surface missions with relatively short-range weapons like the JDAM bomb guidance kits. Because of this, even once Ukraine receives F-16s, it will still most likely have to rely on drones and other current air platforms for support. There's also the question of how to get the proper armaments Ukraine needs to pair with the F-16s. The best way for Ukraine to capitalize on any F-16s it receives will be advanced Western armaments which can stand up to Russian firepower. The issue? Like everything else in a war, these can be staggeringly expensive. For instance, a single AMRAM costs about $1.2 million, while it takes about two years to make one. The US could always provide existing weapons like the AMRAM from its own stockpiles, but that could leave them depleted in the event of an unexpected conflict, a risk the Pentagon is not willing to take. However, the real tactical and logistical advantages that F-16s would provide to Ukraine are long-term. A major benefit is that it will be easier for Ukraine to maintain aircraft whose parts are supplied by the United States and NATO than their current, outdated aircraft manufactured by Russia. 
In turn, this could also make it easier for Ukraine to integrate their air force into NATO sometime in the future. And the more Ukraine's arsenal is compatible with NATO's, the better they'll fare, and the worse off Putin will find himself. For instance, Ukraine was previously given AGM-88 high-speed anti-radiation missiles HARM, to use against ground-based radar systems. As with much of their current military arsenal, they managed to attach the system onto their MiG-29s, but the end result was far from ideal, since Soviet-era fighters were not designed to fire US-manufactured missiles. F-16s with modern software will enable Ukraine to employ harms and other modern weapon systems much more effectively. This includes missiles such as the AIM-9 Sidewinder and the AIM-120, which the United States and NATO are likely to provide, will be useful for Ukraine's defense against Russian cruise missiles like the KH-101 and the KH-555, and against Iranian-made Shahed Kamikaze drones. Ukraine's stockpiles of Soviet S-300 surface-to-air missiles are running out pretty quickly, and there are only so many Patriot missiles available. So even if Russia will still have some superior jets, the F-16's air-to-air capability will definitely help those ground-based defenses last longer, and it's pretty clear that this is necessary. Western military analysts have estimated that Ukraine's combined fleet belonging to air and ground forces has been depleted by more than a third since the Russian invasion began. Ukraine has lost at least 60 of its 145 fixed-wing planes and 32 of 139 helicopters, according to classified US military information leaked on the social media platform Discord in recent months. The Ukrainian Air Force rarely reveals numbers regarding its fleet or other details of tactical importance, including incidents of planes shot down or otherwise destroyed, but officials have acknowledged losses from the more than a year of war, as well as difficulties with the repair and replacement of damaged planes. Another big question is whether the United States will supply powerful JASMs to use with the F-16s. These deadly, low-detection cruise missiles are incredibly long-range and have a 1,000-pound armor-piercing warhead. It also seems there's a good chance of this happening. Britain has provided the Storm Shadow air-launched cruise missiles, and Ukraine has already put them to use. Storm Shadow is generally similar to the baseline version of JASM in terms of size, range, employment, and observability so providing JASMs would not necessarily be an escalation. F-16s utilizing JASMs could allow for Ukrainian Defense Minister Alexei Reznikov's stated long-term plan to retake Crimea without a fight. Carrying out such a plan would require cutting off Russian troops in Crimea from their supply lines via the Kerch Strait Bridge, ports like Sevastopol and the land route from the Russian city of Rostov-on-Don. JASMs could give Ukraine the ability to fire on and destroy logistic hubs like naval bases, ammunition depots, bridges, and command and control facilities deep within Crimea. It could also serve as an alternative to the surface-to-air ATAC-M's missile, which Ukraine has requested but not yet received. The United States has quite a few more JASMs than ATAC-M's, so it might be willing to supply them to augment Ukraine's current arsenal of storm shadows. Another area F-16s could be helpful to Ukraine is as a good old-fashioned deterrent. While Putin clearly has no desire for the war to end, he was recently forced to replace General Sergei Sorovkin due to his involvement in the Wagner Group's attempted coup against Putin himself. Sorovkin was widely known as one of Russia's most trigger-happy commanders, willing to launch indiscriminate attacks against the civilian population of Ukraine. But whoever he gets replaced with may be less gung-ho about ordering air and drone strikes on Kyiv especially if Ukraine has 200 F-16s with which to respond. While there's little chance that Russian attacks will stop in the east, Ukraine having advanced fighter jets may give it enough of an edge in the air that attacks in the west of the country are diminished. The fact that Ukrainian jets and helicopters have been forced to attack cautiously for the entire war means that F-16s and their longer-range weaponry could prove very useful here. Ukrainian pilots have developed a tactic of flying low, unleashing unguided rockets from Ukrainian territory, then immediately backing away to avoid anti-aircraft fire. Russian aircraft use similar tactics but have the advantage of superior firepower, which allows them to fire rockets and gliding bombs from a greater distance. A recent report from the Royal United Services Institute assessed that because of these tactics, even a small number of Western fighters could have a major deterrent effect. While F-16s likely will not grant Ukraine air superiority, they will make the defense of the country's airspace easier and if paired with JASMs or similar weapons, provide an important means of launching the type of long-range weapons which are likely necessary to force Russia out of Crimea and other fortified areas. 
A group of Ukrainian parliament members speaking at the German Marshall Fund in Washington in April said they wanted the F-16 because its radar can locate targets on the ground hundreds of miles away, allowing pilots to stay safely over Ukrainian-held territory while launching weapons into Russian-occupied areas. In addition to defense and deterrence, this also suggests that F-16s could feature in the later stages of the counteroffensive currently underway, which could take the entire rest of the year. Colonel Yuri Inat, a spokesman for the Ukrainian Air Force, seemed to confirm this, telling the New York Times that F-16s could provide cover for Ukrainian troops trying to advance and hold formerly occupied areas. He noted that it could also be used to cut off Russian planes that have started launching guided missiles more than 30 miles from the Ukrainian front line, to defend the sea route that lets Ukrainian grain leave the country and to push further into the Russian-occupied oblasts. All of this helps explain why the Kremlin seems so nervous about the possibility of F-16s in Ukrainian hands. When it became clear that the US would greenlight their training and eventual transfer, Russian diplomats had a minor meltdown. First, Deputy Foreign Minister Sergei Rybakov said any transfer of the US jets to Ukraine would be pointless, since Russia's capabilities are more than enough to end the special military operation whenever they want. Now, by this point, we probably don't need to tell you that that's pure BS. When that was pointed out, Russian ambassador to the United States Anatoly Antonov went on to claim that even if the F-16s were transferred, they couldn't possibly be effective, since Ukraine lacks the proper infrastructure, pilots, and maintenance personnel. While this is slightly more true, given the country's incredible adaptability so far, there's no reason to think that Ukraine can't make F-16s work, given the right amount of time and training. The Kremlin knows this, and it seems to be making their threats increasingly desperate. When the statements by Antonov and Rybakov failed to scare NATO or the US, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov took the stage during a speech at a military conference in Tajikistan. He claimed that, we must keep in mind that one of the modifications of the F-16 can accommodate nuclear weapons. If they do not understand this, then they are worthless as military strategists and planners. This is obviously pretty ironic considering Russia's continual failures in military planning for the last year, but also shows a deep-seated worry from top officials. They likely don't think that the US would ever give Ukraine nuclear warheads, but know that even if F-16s do not change the battle space in the short term, they will bring Ukraine closer to the West and increase the country's military resilience. The West's response to these threats was also summed up pretty well in the reply to Lavrov by Pentagon spokesperson John Kirby that, if you're worried about Ukrainian military capabilities, then you should take your troops and leave Ukraine. This back and forth over F-16s highlights a larger trend in the war, that Ukraine's warfighting increasingly looks like that of the West, rather than a former Soviet satellite state. Because Russia failed so badly to understand the depth of Ukrainian resolve, Every step Putin and his cronies take pushes Ukraine towards NATO, the EU, and the US. By the end of the war, whenever that might come, Ukraine will have extremely close military, economic, and political ties to Europe and America. The F-16s are just the latest part of this broader shift, but the fact that their transfer has been approved is another sign that the Ukraine of 2021 is not the same as the one we see today. War has transformed the country into a major regional military power with advanced equipment and some of Europe's most battle-hardened troops. Even though Putin somehow hasn't learned his lesson yet, there's no doubt that Ukraine will play a major role in the future of European security. But what do you think? What does the transfer of F-16s to Ukraine mean for the future of the conflict? And will it be enough to overcome Russia's military? Let us know in the comments below and don't forget to subscribe for more military content and analysis. The Navy along with aviation, are the branches of the military in which Russia had an incredible advantage before the start of a full-scale invasion of Ukraine and until now, but it's useless. Why is the country with the third strongest navy losing a water war to Ukraine? The last attacks on Crimea and Russian navy bases proved once more that Russian navy superiority makes no sense on the battlefield. In this video, we will explain why. Let's start with the numbers. Prior to the invasion, the Russian naval forces had a total of 266 active units in their inventory. The Russian Navy placed a strong emphasis on safeguarding its coastline and conducting underwater operations, with a significant allocation of resources to corvettes, comprising 31.2%, with 83 units, submarines, constituting 21.8%, with 58 units, and mine countermine warfare, making up 18% with 48 units. The remainder of the fleet exhibited a relatively even distribution. 
encompassing categories such as aircraft carriers 1 unit, cruisers and battle cruisers 5 units, destroyers 12 units, frigates 11 units, offshore patrol vessels 27 units, and amphibious assault support ships 21 units. The majority of Russian vessels were considered outdated and had been inherited from the USSR. The most prominent examples are the aircraft carrier Kuznetsov, which was 32 years old, the cruiser Moskva, which was 39, and the destroyer Vadim Kulikov, which was 40. As of February 24th, the Russian Federation's Black Sea Fleet comprised a total of 275 ships and vessels, with just 58 of them classified as combat ships. When considering patrol boats alongside combat vessels, the Black Sea Fleet's combined combat-capable units numbered 74 by February 2022. In the months leading up to the full-scale invasion, Russia systematically removed almost any naval assets that could potentially be used for a seaborne invasion. A total of 46 warships were redeployed from all of the Russian Federation's fleets to the Black and Azov Seas. Under the pretext of conducting large-scale exercises, the Kremlin effectively established a naval blockade along the Black Sea coastline of Ukraine from February 13 to 19, 2022. The Mediterranean Sea also witnessed an unprecedented presence of Russian troops, consisting of 17 warships from all four Russian Federation fleets, including two missile cruisers, as well as an additional seven missile ships of various types, including two missile submarines. But how have Russia's naval moves changed Ukraine's navy? During the initial phase of the Russian-Ukraine war and the occupation of Crimea in 2014, Russian forces seized 51 Ukrainian ships, accounting for 85% of the Ukrainian Navy fleet. Imagine how bad that was. By 2022, the Ukrainian Navy's active naval inventory consisted of only 15 units. The contemporary Ukrainian Navy heavily relied on its patrol force. The service faced significant deficiencies across various categories and domains, primarily comprising aging vessel ships in critical areas essential for naval effectiveness. For instance, their lone frigate, the Sahai Dachny, is approaching three decades in service, while their single mine or countermine vessel has exceeded 35 years of service. Apart from a couple of landing craft, which have also significantly surpassed their intended service life, the service possesses a limited collection of offshore patrol vessels, OPVs. Among these OPVs, the youngest hulls are no more than five years old, while the oldest ones date back four decades. Okay, so Ukraine's fleet experienced significant losses right from the start, but what exactly happened? At the outset of the invasion, Russian warships were relocated to the Odessa area. Subsequently, Russian forces managed to seize control of Snake Island, Serpent Island or Zmini Island, a small yet strategically significant island southwest of Odessa. The valiant defense of the island by Ukrainian forces, along with the defiant phrase, Russian warship go F yourself, played a crucial role in bolstering the morale of Ukrainians who had endured heavy losses over an extended period. On March 3, 2022, Ukraine deliberately sank its frigate, the Sahai Dutchny, as it had encountered the ravages of war near the wells of a factory in Mykolaiv and was deemed unfit for further service. On the same day, another setback occurred for the Ukrainian fleet when the Ukrainian patrol vessel Slovyansk was sunk by a Russian Federation aircraft struck by a KH-31 missile. In early March, the patrol ship Karets and riverboat BK-02 Ackerman and BK-06 Vishorod were also captured in Berdyansk. Likewise, in early March, BK-04 Kremenchuk and BK-05 Lubny were seized in Mariupol. The small reconnaissance ship A-512 Periaslev likely sustained damage on the Dnipro River in late March 2022. The amphibious assault boat Stanislav was lost during a Ukrainian counterattack on the Zmini Island on May 7, 2022. The island was deoccupied at the beginning of July. Subsequently, in July 2022, the raid minesweeper Henichesk was sunk in a missile attack carried out by Russian aircraft. Another boat was hit on November 4, 2022. From that time until today, several other ships were also damaged. As a conclusion, the small Ukrainian fleet suffered huge losses. But it didn't give up at all. In spite of these achievements and the blockade of Ukrainian ports, the aggressor eventually faced consequences for their invasion. As of October 1, 2023, a total of 20 Russian ships and boats, along with one submarine, have been destroyed, 
marking two significant turning points on March 24 and April 14, 2022, that forever altered perceptions of the invincibility of the Russian fleet. On March 24, 2022, substantial damage was inflicted on the large amphibious ships Novochakask and Sezakunikov, while the large amphibious assault ship Saratov was completely destroyed. This incident resulted in numerous casualties and injuries among personnel, as well as damage to military equipment that had been transported by these ships to the occupied port of Berdyansk. Saratov came under attack from Ukrainian Tochka U missiles, a Soviet tactical missile system originally designed for ground targets and not previously employed against ships. What a surprise! On the night of April 13th to April 14th, which was 21 days after the attack on the large amphibious ships in Berdyansk, the flagship of the Russian Federation's Black Sea Fleet, the guard missile cruiser Moskva, came under attack. Let's delve into this particular incident in greater detail. So here's what happened. The ship met its demise when it was targeted by two Ukrainian-made Neptune missiles. The inaugural Neptune system, mounted on a new Tatra chassis, was assembled in August 2021 in preparation for Ukraine's 30th Independence Day parade. However, the first batch of missiles ordered by the state for the military didn't reach Odessa until February 20, 2022. Initial missile launches occurred promptly, prior to February 26, when three Russian amphibious ships departed from ports in Crimea and steered towards the Ukrainian coast in the Mykolaiv region. The Russians managed to intercept and neutralize all three missiles, but the realization that Ukraine possessed this missile capability prompted the ships to hastily return to Crimea. This development surprised the Russians since the Neptune missiles weren't scheduled to be in the armed forces' arsenal by late February. Following the failed launch, doubts arose regarding the missile's quality. In mid-March, experts from Kyiv conducted an inspection and discovered that all the missiles shared a single component failure, which had prevented them from detonating as intended. This issue was promptly rectified, and the Neptune missiles awaited an opportune moment for testing, which unexpectedly came on April 13th. You can't even imagine how lucky the Ukrainians were. Conventional radar indicated the presence of a significant target roughly 120 kilometers from the coast. In this sector of the Black Sea, only one object matched the size. The flagship of the Russian Federation's Black Sea fleet, the cruiser Moskva. Due to dense clouds over the sea, the radar signal bounced off the clouds onto the water's surface and back to the clouds. The Russians were so confident in their invulnerability to Ukrainian forces that they likely hadn't even activated their air defense systems. Even if they had, the Neptune missiles would have posed formidable challenges for them. The Neptune is a slow-moving, liquid-fueled missile that approaches its target unnoticed until the very last moment, making it almost invisible to standard air defense systems as it skims over the water. It boasts a maximum flight range of up to 300 kilometers and a speed of 900 kilometers an hour, with a missile length of 5,050 millimeters and a launch weight of around 870 kilograms, including a 150 kilogram combat warhead. These specifications are more than sufficient for disabling combat surface ships and transport vessels weighing up to 5,000 tons. The missile is equipped with a cross shaped folding wing, and its warhead is activated either upon target contact or remotely via non-contact sensors. The vacuum-packed warhead significantly enhances the explosive effect. The missile's homing warhead boasts ultra-wide viewing angles of plus 60 degrees, can identify and lock onto a target from a distance of 50 kilometers, and is highly resistant to enemy radar jamming. By comparison, the American Harpoon anti-ship missile has less robust characteristics, with viewing angles of plus 45 degrees. Thanks to the effective deployment of these two missiles, the missile cruiser Moskva was sunk. Following these events, Russia's diminishing capabilities became evident. The loss of the Moskva marked the most significant military setback for Russia in the war with Ukraine, given its residual value of $750 million. Beyond the financial and reputational losses, the Russian fleet also suffered strategic and tactical setbacks. After the sinking of the Moskva, which served as the air defense umbrella, five to six Russian ships in the Black Sea withdrew from the Ukrainian coast. Imagine how they felt. In early May 2022, Russia attempted to fortify the vulnerable garrison stationed on the captured Ukrainian island of Zmini. However, after the loss of the Moskva and the retreat of the Russian fleet to Crimea, protecting Russian supply ships in the western part of the Black Sea became increasingly challenging. This vessel symbolized Russia's Black Sea fleet and was among the best in its class. 
boasting an impressive tonnage to armament ratio, its primary mission involved engaging carrier groups, frigates, and cruisers using 16 Vulcan cruise missiles. The ship featured a fort or S 300 air defense system battery, torpedoes, and helicopters. The Moskva played a pivotal role in establishing an air defense umbrella through air target detection radar stations and missile systems. Other Russian ships in the naval group relied on the flagship's cover as they lacked robust means of detecting and destroying targets. The absence of the cruiser at sea soon had significant repercussions. On May 2nd, two Russian patrol boats of Project 03160, Raptor, and the landing ship of Project 11770, Cerna, were struck by TB-2 Bayraktar drones near Snake Island. On May 5th, a Russian frigate of Project 11356R type Petrel caught fire near the Ukrainian island of Zmini in the Black Sea, presumably after being hit by a Neptune missile. On May 7th, near Zmini Island in the Black Sea, Ukrainian defenders destroyed a Russian Cerna type boat. On June 17th, in the vicinity of the island, the Ukrainian Navy launched two harpoon missiles, targeting the tugboat lifeguard Vasil Beck. Although it was not sunk, the ship had to be towed to Sevastopol. Isolated from supplies and unable to sustain its defense of the island, the Russian garrison evacuated Zmini on June 30th. With the loss of cruiser Moskva, along with its long-range missiles and the relinquishing of control over Zmini Island, the Russian Black Sea Fleet's ability to deploy significant Russian amphibious forces and protect them against air and missile attacks was compromised. This means what? That Russia can no longer establish a coastal front along the western Ukrainian coast for an assault on the port of Odessa, which remains Ukraine's primary strategic maritime outlet. Prior to the effective use of anti-ship systems like Neptune and Harpoon, Russian ships would approach the coast from a distance of 18 to 25 miles and unleash artillery fire with impunity. The introduction of these weapons significantly altered Russia's tactics, as ships started to maintain a closer proximity to the Crimean Peninsula, avoiding any approach within 100 kilometers of the coastline under Ukrainian control. Both missile systems have an estimated range of approximately 174 miles when fired from the shore, covering nearly the entire northwestern portion of the Black Sea, but falling short of reaching the Russian Navy's base in Sevastopol. Following the acquisition of Grim-2 missiles by the Ukrainian armed forces, capable of covering a distance of 310 miles on a quasi-ballistic trajectory, and two naval drone attacks on the main base in Sevastopol, Russian missile carriers now venture to sea only when accompanied by boats, taking refuge near the southern coast of Crimea. Speaking of naval drones, they've been an absolute game-changer, altering not only the course of the Russo-Ukraine conflict, but also the landscape of modern warfare itself and it is primarily Ukraine that deserves the credit for this monumental development. Naval drones have emerged as a notable innovation in this war. In the Black Sea, Ukraine has ushered in a new era of naval warfare with the use of suicide sea drones, armed with explosives designed to ram into targets and detonate upon impact. Scott Savitz, a senior analyst at the RAND Corporation, commented that Ukraine has employed these explosive uncrewed surface vessels, USVs, as formidable weapons against Russian fleets and even infrastructure. Savitz's analysis highlights that seafaring drones possess a unique capability to carry substantial explosive payloads and strike at the waterline of ships, rendering them more dangerous than aerial weapons like missiles and bombs. Furthermore, their relatively low cost allows Ukraine to execute attacks with a large number of drones, making them difficult to detect by Russian warships despite their scale. Ukraine initially employed sea drones in a significant attack in October 2022, targeting Russia's naval base in Sevastopol. Following this, Ukraine developed more sophisticated drones capable of carrying larger explosive payloads. In recent months, Ukrainian sea drones have successfully targeted a Russian warship near a naval port and a Russian oil tanker. Each drone costs only about $250,000, yet it has the potential to inflict damage on or destroy multi-million dollar Russian vessels. As these drones are relatively new, they are compelling Russia to develop advanced defenses against them. How can Russia respond to such innovation? It needs to allocate additional resources to protect its ships, ports and bridges, safeguarding its economy and troop resupply capability. These sea drones exemplify Ukraine's ingenuity in outsmarting a more powerful and better armed adversary. Throughout history, wars have often spurred innovations in naval technology. The American Civil War witnessed the debut of ironclad warships, 
While World War I introduced widespread submarine warfare, World War II demonstrated the superiority of aircraft carriers over battleships. The Russian-Ukrainian war showed how good the naval drones were. However, drones are better suited for attacking stationary targets such as ports, ships at anchor, and hydraulic structures. Targeting fast and maneuverable ships presents greater challenges, requiring constant location updates, and although 154 pounds of explosives might damage a corvette or frigate, it's unlikely to destroy them. So, Ukraine started to develop more advanced drones. Civilian vessels loaded with military equipment make more effective targets, as they are slower and typically follow predictable routes. Instances of attacks on warships in the open sea have also been reported. You can't even imagine what a success that was. In May 2023, drones struck the Russian reconnaissance ship Ivan Kurs. On the night of July 25th, the Russian Ministry of Defense reported an attempted attack on the patrol ship Sergei Kotov, which was believed to have been dispatched by the Russians to intercept civilian vessels. Some drones have the range to project force across the entire Black Sea. In November, they targeted the oil terminal at Novorossiysk, which was only 546 yards from the submarine parking area, as noted by naval expert Volodymyr Zablotsky of Defense Express. He emphasized that the Black Sea lacks safe havens for the enemy. Currently, Ukraine is developing and using various models of maritime drones. We'll tell you about some of them. The new underwater drone Marichka, which passes the first tests. The drone is designed to attack surface and underwater targets, bridges, and coastal fortifications. If necessary, an unmanned ship can transport cargo, for which it is equipped with several compartments, or engage in reconnaissance. Length 6.56 yards, width 1.09 yards, range 621 miles, price about $400,000. Another drone is the Magura V5 surface drone. Length 6 yards, width 1.64 yards, height above the waterline 0.54 yards, cruising speed 22 knots, 25.28 miles per hour, maximum speed 42 knots, 48.5 miles an hour, range 517.6 miles, and payload 705 pounds. Magura V5 is controlled via satellite or radio. The marine drone is equipped with a video camera and broadcasts video from it online. The drone is multifunctional. In addition to hitting targets, it can carry out reconnaissance, surveillance, patrolling, security, and demining. Controlling a drone does not require a complex infrastructure. Only a control panel comparable in size to a laptop is required. In addition to the operator, the device is serviced by several other people. Despite the considerable weight, no special construction is required to launch the drone on the water. A special feature of Magura V5 is the ability to work in a swarm of three drones. At the same time, the main one of them has hardware differences. Probably the additional equipment is a signal repeater. The Sea Baby drone is assembled underground at the factory in Ukraine. Payload 992 to 1,874 pounds. Range at least 435 miles. In addition to the Crimean Bridge, the drones successfully destroyed the large amphibious ship Olenogorsky Gorniak and the Russian tanker SIG. Naval drones allow you to effectively disable enemy ships and other targets in and near the water. The armed forces proved effective in sea battles despite the actual absence of a fleet. There are a few enemy ships compared to other types of equipment, so disabling each one is a great achievement. The Russians destroy up to 70% of naval drones, but the remaining 30% cause them significant problems. You know they'll cause it. The cost of the drone and the ship is incomparable. The creation of a separate brigade of naval drones indicates a large number of them are in service. First in world history, Ukraine creates a fleet of maritime drones, which has already compelled the Russians to conceal their ships. President Volodymyr Zelensky announced this development at the International Forum of Defense Industries on September 30, 2023. Currently, there are 134 types of maritime drones worldwide, but most are reconnaissance or training models. Ukrainian drones stand out for their pioneering effectiveness in actual combat operations at sea as a component of full-scale warfare. Although Ukraine's pioneering use of sea drones may not necessarily shift the tide of war, it could have a similar transformative effect. Ukraine's attack on Sevastopol marked the world's first instance of combining sea and aerial drones in warfare. They were also successfully combined with long-range missiles. Drones are a key component of the Ukrainian Mosquito Fleet concept. This is the concept that fast and maneuverable warships can deal significant damage to larger enemy ships, thereby being more effective. Currently, naval drones can serve at least three roles. Demining the coastal zone, 
conducting maritime reconnaissance, particularly near Crimea, and executing force projection and strike missions. Ultimately, we can say that long-range anti-ship missiles and naval drones force the Russian fleet to retreat as far as possible to those safe zones that still remain. Currently, Ukraine is working on destroying Russian air defense systems, ships near Crimea, and headquarters. Due to the latest tactics, the entire potential of the Russian fleet is being destroyed. Do you think an effective weapon against naval drones will be invented? Or is that an end to the Navy? What do you think will be the war to war in the future? Let us know in the comments and don't forget to subscribe for more military analysis from military experts. Poor training is killing Russian pilots, and it's not looking good for Putin's ambitions in Ukraine. Despite having over 700 aircraft, including as many as 400 modern multi-role fighter jets and fighter bomber planes to its name, the Russian Aerospace Forces, or VKS, has experienced dramatic losses over the Ukrainian skies. Estimates vary, though some suggest that the VKS has lost around 130 planes and the pilots flying them since the beginning of the war. Why have these losses been so severe? Though equipment issues have certainly played a role, the far bigger issue for Russia right now is the apparent lack of training many of its pilots received prior to taking to the skies during the conflict. And that inferior training, which is already leading to many more than Russia anticipated, not only suggests we'll see more of the country's pilots lose their lives in the current conflict, but may lead to the complete breakdown of the VKS as a powerful force in the future. This is not what Putin expected. When the conflict between Russia and Ukraine began, many assumed that Russia would have the advantage on almost all fronts. A historically great, if somewhat slow-moving, military nation, the country was believed to have a stockpile of weaponry that would allow it to overwhelm Ukrainian forces that would likely have to rely on guerrilla tactics while fighting on home soil, and as mentioned, the country has a huge stockpile of aircraft ready to fly. Along with the 400 modern fighters discussed earlier, it was believed the VKS has over 300 legacy planes that have been converted to handle modern combat capabilities, MiG-31BM and MiG-29SMTs among them, to create an impressive air force that would wreak havoc on Ukrainian defenses. In fact, the prevailing opinion was that Russia's VKS was so well-trained that its pilots could effectively use this blend between modern and repurposed planes as part of COMEOs, composite air operations that could involve up to 100 aircraft. Many believe, despite some of the country's aircraft starting to show their age, the modern fighter jets it has, which include the Su-34 and Su-35, would make up for any airborne deficiencies that could occur. That hasn't happened. And looking at Russia's recent history in wartime situations, the reasons why become clearer. Take its 2015 intervention in the Syrian civil war as an example. Rather than using composite air operations or COMEOs, most of Russia's sorties in this conflict focused on sending single aircraft or paired fighters to either patrol the skies or drop weapons, unguided, to ground troops. Though perhaps escaping attention at the time, this lack of COMEO use hinted at a larger problem in the VKS that we've only seen come to fruition about half a decade later. The VKS may not have flown COMEOs because their pilots were simply incapable of the job. The question is simple, why? Why did the VKS actively avoid employing COMEO tactics in Syria, despite COMEOs being much more effective than single and paired pilot runs? And why hasn't the VKS improved its approach during the Ukrainian conflict? It appears the answer may come down to a combination of a variety of factors. Let's start with inferior equipment. There's an old saying that a good worker never blames their tools for failing to get the job done. However, that saying doesn't apply in the world of air combat, where even the slightest issue with equipment can make the difference between life and death. In Russia's case, the tools they're providing to their pilots don't appear to be fit for purpose when it comes to succeeding in an extended conflict, such as the one the war in Ukraine has become. Take the supposedly modernized MiG fighters that make up a large proportion of the country's air fleet as an example. According to the RAND Corporation, these Soviet-era aircraft, which have been in operation since the 1980s, were built to handle up to 3,500 hours of flight. And though many of the craft have been upgraded to extend this maximum output, the fact remains that much of Moscow's fleet, particularly its MiGs and the earlier SU models, are reaching the end of their service lives. In fact, RAND estimates that Russia may have lost up to 57 of its aircraft due to the extra hours asked of them beyond their capabilities, with some being shot down due to a combination of reasons, pilot inadequacy and the craft itself no longer being viable in combat. Now let's switch our attention to the more modern fighters in the Russian fleet. 
The Su-35 is the jewel in the Moscow crown, but when it's stacked up against other modern fighters, particularly the American F-22 Raptor stealth jet, it gets left in the dust every time. Take the Su-35's radar cross-section, for instance. Business Insider reported back in 2016 that the Su-35's radar cross-section landed somewhere between 3 and 10 feet, easily detectable by most advanced radar hardware. By comparison, the F-22s came back at the size of a marble. Having a more detectable plane creates a challenge for even the most skilled of pilots, but for the poorly trained flyers in the VKS it's practically a death sentence. There are other issues. For instance, the Su-35 is also one of the few modern fighter jets not to have an active electronically scanned array ASA, radar, instead using the older passive electronically scanned array PACER radars. Those PACER radars are more prone to jamming and malfunctions and aren't as capable as ACES of detecting smaller targets, especially those on the ground. And so, we see the modern Russian pilot's first problem. They're flying and being trained on outdated military hardware that isn't fit for purpose when stacked against modern options. But this brings us to an interesting point. Ukraine hardly has the most advanced fleet either, with much of its meager air force using similar updated Soviet-era machines as the Russians and yet far more Russian pilots are getting shot down or crashing compared to Ukrainian pilots. There must be more going on behind the scenes, and if you look a little closer, it becomes a lot easier to see the evidence of poor training that may be at the heart of Russia's recent flight failures. In 2022, Harry Bonham, an aerospace analyst at the analytics company Global Data, offered some insight into what the VKS's pilot training methodology looks like. He said that training outlines provided by the VKS indicated that a graduating pilot from the Russian Air Force's academy had to complete over 100 hours of flight time as recently as 2017, with that number only increasing to over 120 hours in recent years. By comparison, he points out that the average Western pilot will notch between 180 and 240 flight hours under their belt before they head out into the field up to double the flight time amassed by a supposedly qualified Russian equivalent. Perhaps we see a link between Russian training methods and the deteriorating state of its air fleet here. Remember that Rand points out a large portion of the VKS's fleet is outdated to the point where some of its planes are hitting the end of their lives as the conflict goes on, reducing Russian air strength in the process. Could the lack of training hours Russian pilots undergo, at least in comparison to their Western equivalents, be blamed on the VKS essentially rationing out the flight hours the older equipment in its fleet still has available. That's speculative, but it would at least partially explain why Russian pilots are handicapped by having fewer flight hours than pilots from other nations. But what's more important is the effect that this lack of flight hours has on pilots during active operations. Bonham points out that Russian authorities are likely aware of the issues this inexperience causes, which has undermined their confidence in their ability to pull off joint operations particularly with the SAM units their troops have on the ground. We also see a lack of confidence in Russia's failure to leverage Komeo tactics, as discussed earlier, and that, combined with logistical issues, appears to hamper Russia's ability to not only secure Ukrainian airspace, but to do so without suffering casualties. Inexperience may also come into play when it comes to Russia's scarce use of precision-guided munitions PGMs. It's known that the VKS has access to PGMs, which can be guided to their targets using a combination of lasers and the Russian equivalent of GPS, GLONASS, and yet we've seen fairly few of these types of munitions utilized in the Ukraine conflict. We can speculate in several directions when it comes to why, with one of the more popular opinions being that Russia has failed to stockpile enough PGMs for an extended conflict, hence their need to ration the munitions. But what seems equally likely is that many of the country's pilots simply don't know how to deploy PGMs effectively. Again, the lack of training hours comes into play here, taking away a form of attack that would aid in pilot safety. How? Rather than using PGMs, the VKS has generally used dumb bombs to attack Ukrainian targets. These unguided munitions can only hit targets once the pilot achieves visual confirmation of the target's existence, which forces the pilot to fly low and steady, making them a sitting duck for anti-air attacks. And that mention of flying low brings us to another issue with Russian pilot training. Many of its pilots seem to struggle to fly low safely. An April 2023 report by the Royal United Services Institute, a think tank based in the UK, highlighted that Russia's pilots either seem to be unwilling or incapable of providing close air support to troops on the ground. Providing that support would require pilots to know how to fly safely at low altitudes, 
which the report says is something that many, if not most, Russian pilots simply haven't been trained to do. The report goes on to state that flying at low altitudes, especially in contested situations, isn't part of the core training that Russian pilots go through in order to earn their wings. The only ones that can are typically members of the Su-25SM Frogfoot fleet, a small part of the VKS's fleet. That lack of low-altitude training bore its most terrible fruits, at least from a Russian perspective, during the first week of March 2022. The country lost 10 of its jets alongside several helicopters in that week, all shot down by Ukrainian forces, and most flying below 3,000 feet in daylight conditions. Those crafts became instantly vulnerable to Ukrainian manpads, shoulder-fired missiles deployed by ground-based troops, and it's not speculative to say that the VKS quickly decided that having its pilots flying low to the ground, especially in daylight hours, simply wasn't an option anymore. After that first week of March 2022, the VKS quickly switched from using fixed-wing and rotary craft on the front lines to bombarding Ukrainian troops with unguided rockets and minimal PGM attacks. Speaking of Russian aircraft shot down during the early stages of the war, Another issue was discovered that perfectly demonstrates how the combination of poor training and inadequate equipment leads to the deaths of so many VKS pilots. In a speech at the National Army Museum in May 2022, the then Defense Secretary of the United Kingdom, Ben Wallace, noted that several downed VKS jets had been found with insecure navigational equipment. As Wallace, a graduate of Sandhurst's Royal Military Academy, put it, the equipment essentially seemed to be GPS receivers that were taped to the dashboards of the jets. These findings raise more questions. Does the VKS have so little faith in the Russian GLONASS system that it's willing to place its pilots at risk by supplying them with insecure and unencrypted GPS receivers that make them easier to detect? Or has the lack of training these pilots have received led them to independently trying to use these GPS systems because they're unaware of the risks that come with navigating using unsecured equipment? Either possibility is disturbing, but both could have played a hand in why Russia lost so many of its pilots during the early stages of the Ukraine conflict. Even so, Russia is a large country with a population of nearly 145 million people. Even with the loss of so many pilots due to poor training and inadequate equipment, Surely it can train more to replace those losses, and even with so many of its jets being shot down, it still easily has the aerial might to subdue Ukraine, right? Unfortunately for Russia, it's not that simple. A May 2022 story published in the Moscow Times reported that Major General Kanamat Batashev was shot down from the skies over Ukraine while piloting a Su-25 fighter jet. While that story may seem unremarkable in the context of the dramatic losses Russia has already experienced, it becomes more interesting when you learn that Botashev was a 63-year-old retired pilot. What's more, he'd essentially been forced into retirement from active duty in 2012 after he'd crashed at Su-27 while demonstrating acrobatic maneuvers, which raises an obvious question. What was a retired and high-ranking member of the Russian military doing flying on the front lines of the conflict? The answer likely comes back to the lack of training the country's other pilots have. Perhaps the VKS wasn't confident in the skills of its younger flyers, forcing them into bringing older pilots who are perhaps not up to speed on modern flying into the fold. Botashev's death shows that it may not have been a good tactic. Still, it also presents another problem for Russia, as his death, along with the deaths of other senior members, could have a knock-on effect on the quality of future pilots in the VKS. In fact, this is something that Yuri Inat, the spokesman for the Ukrainian Air Force, all but said in comments published in Ukrainska Pravda, an online Ukrainian news website. He points out that the VKS is continuing to train pilots in its academy and likely has the ability to create between 100 and 150 new pilots annually. So there's little danger of the VKS running out of flyers. But Inart points out that the quality of those pilots will be lower in comparison to those who've already been shot down, as many of the pilots so far were veterans of the Syrian conflict mentioned earlier. So, the future clearly presents a problem for the VKS on two fronts. First, it appears to rely on sheer numbers to overwhelm Ukrainian defenses. This has already been demonstrated not to work and will only become a less viable tactic as more inexperienced pilots enter the conflict. Second, losing so many of its veterans to the war means that the pilots the VKS train in the future will lose valuable sources of knowledge, both in the academy and when they're in the field compounding their inexperience to the point where it becomes dangerous. And worse yet for Putin, it's not just Ukrainians shooting down his most experienced flyers that he has to worry about, it's his own people. In June 2023, 
Putin confirmed that the Wagner militia mutineers managed to down 13 VKS pilots during their short-lived insurrection. That's 13 on top of the 130 or so that Ukraine has managed to shoot down, and it's likely that at least some of those pilots were experienced veterans. The picture painted here is grim. If the VKS's pilots can't even handle a militia mutiny, one that lasted only a day, what chance do they have when trying to take on Ukrainian troops on less familiar soil? Ironically, fighting from within has done as much to expose the poor training of the VKS pilots as the war in Ukraine has. Through all of this, it's important not to discount the fact that Ukraine has done an excellent job of exploiting the weaknesses inherent in the VKS approach. For instance, Forbes reports that the VKS training doctrine essentially classes its air force as an extension of its army. That approach, which again is mirrored in the training that the VKS pilots receive, leads to Russia approaching air combat as a way to briefly control small portions of airspace so its craft can come in, drop bombs, and leave. That runs counter to the Kameo approach taken by the US Air Force, which focuses on coordinated efforts to control large amounts of airspace and, as we've already seen, plays right into Ukraine's hands. VKS pilots are trained to come in and deploy munitions, but at the same time, that tactic requires an understanding of low-altitude flight, which we've already established is an understanding many VKS pilots don't have. Ukraine has taken advantage of this lack of training in the very approach that Russia favors to down dozens of fixed-wing fighters using manpads backed by long-range defense systems, such as Tunguska and Tor. It's smart work by the Ukrainians. Knowing how Russia was likely to use its air fleet to attack, it essentially forced dozens of inexperienced pilots flying at low altitudes directly into a path of its anti-air defenses. And due, at least in part, to their lack of training, many of these pilots did not know how to avoid ground-based defenses that are hardly innovative in the theater of war. When you combine this knowledge of VKS tactics with the consistent stream of information and equipment Ukraine is receiving from its Western allies, the situation continues to look dire for a Russian air force that is already depleted and likely only to be restocked with more poorly trained pilots. Finally, consider this. In August 2023, the United States approved the delivery of F-16 fighter jets to Ukraine. While far from the newest jets the US has to offer, F-16s have poorer radar and less capable missiles than Russia's Su-35, it's entirely possible that better training delivered to Ukraine's pilots could lead them to understanding their crafts better than Russian pilots understand the ones they're flying. So it may not be long before we see reports of Ukrainian pilots actively downing Russian ones in dogfights, assuming Russia is brave enough to send its pilots to fight Ukraines directly, given the losses the VKS has experienced so far. But what do you think? How large a role has the poor training offered to Russia's pilots played in the losses the VKS has suffered during the conflict? Is Russia even capable of creating a new crop of pilots that won't fall victim to the combination of outdated equipment, ineffective training, and superior Ukrainian tactics in the future? Tell us your opinions in the comment section below.